All right. I still haven't gotten used to exactly when. Uh, I'm thinking about doing one of those things that people have where it's, um, you know, you have the screen where it shows, oh, incoming and blah, blah, all this other kind of stuff. But hey, guys, how's it going? So today we're checking out Xenotech Heresies 4 through 6. And I just did a BarkBox unboxing uh, for the Patreons. Hey, Aquila, what's going on, bud? All right, let me scroll up, see who's all here. Thank you, Squire. Squire says, this time, Twitch saves everyone. Eldar suck and Sarge doesn't. Twitch almost kills everyone and a fleet gets swatted out of existence. Here we go. Uh, Master of Context is here. Fox the Bruh is here. Obsidian Black is here. Obsidian, you changed your uh, icon. I'll have to take a look at that in a little while. Zach's here. Ronnie's here. Um, guys, Ronnie has put together something, frankly, amazing. Um, he is attempting to get uh, live stream setups where he can actually discuss this with you. Something I recommend right now, definitely go subscribe to Ronnie's channel. He has put together an amazing mod in uh, Tabletop Simulator for a 40k map, and I really recommend you guys go check that out, because the the little bit that I've been able to see, the times that I've been able to be on Discord with him and actually jump in and see his streams, because he's been live streaming this from Discord, um, it looks amazing. So definitely go check that out. Thank you, Scryer. Um, Wolf, Wolf's joining while doing yard work. Man, it's the best time to do it. Any t like, the amount of times I've had stuff in my ears while I'm doing just basic things is great. Uh, Plasmatic is here. Our nukes is here. The bloody magpie. Hey, bud. It's, got, it's good that you're able to come this time. Lone Guardsman is here. Aquila, of course. The Slacker is here. Wolf, YouTube. Oh, the stream started. Have a commercial. I don't know. Um, at some point, um, a bunch of people mobbed me to get YouTube, uh, YouTube Premium, and I... I can't recommend it enough. Hobbit says, Namquan is here. Richard Johnson's here. Hobbit says, ah, time for a refurbished good time. On your refurbished stream, here you go. Uh, let's see. Chicken Wing Analogy is here. Darth Revan, freaking shark. And Darth Revan says this is his favorite episode of AG, AGP. Okay. Um, Arthur Huxick is here. Watering your neighbor's plants. You know, yeah, it has been... It was actually not too hot here yesterday, me and the hospitaler. It was one of the first times in a while we've actually been able to go out and do something for ourselves. So she wanted to go fishing, and I didn't have a, you know, I didn't have a leg to stand on. Um, guys, Mistakes of the Emperor 6 is finished. It has taken a while, um, but it is finally done. And what's going to happen now is I'm going to be um, basically putting it out next week on Saturday after the live stream I'll be setting up a premiere time after the live stream or maybe before I might delay the live stream for the premiere uh, because I have been uh, I've had th rocks thrown at me for not premiering anything when uh, the European crowd can come by and take a look at it so chances are I'll it's either gonna be before the live stream or after the live stream um, and I'm leaning t now that I think about it, I'm leaning towards before um, I am kind of recovering from, I've had swimmer's ear in both ears. So this ear right now kind of has a, like a reverb in it. It is what it is. Um, Hobbit, where do you live where it's 104 degrees today? Because like right now it's, t today's one of those days that it's, it's 76 outside and I'm thanking God it is. Um... Brian Fitz says, I am out of booze and disappoint. Hair of the dog is king. <laughs> nice, bud. Um, Zigmark says, is AGP just a bunch of refurbished RPG sessions? Yes. Yes. It's a dramatic retelling of a uh, RPG campaign. Northeastern Oregon is 104? Are you sitting next to a fire, sir? Jesus! <laughs> I know the roof... Bloody Magpie says the refurbished joke has become so ingrained in this community to show up everywhere now. Yes, it's a refurbished joke. <clears throat> All right, so it is time for the Xenotech Heresy Part 4. We've had to deal with Eldar. I'm just glad we don't have to do. Um, oh, 
I'm just glad we don't have to deal with the Tau anymore. That's just my thing. Um, there is more. Ref Aquila says there's more refurbishing this shit than after the Admech finds a Dark Age of Technology machine stash. This is very true. Birds are attacking you at work and are literally dive bombing you and your coworkers when we when oh, that sucks. Ugh. Uh no idea, Darius. Like the the math right now is not in my head. In any case, X is in the chat if you're ready for part four. So I'm gonna be doing part four and part five, and then we're gonna take a short, like two, three minute break before we start on part six. Uh, mainly like I take some stuff for the, for, for the swimmers here right now and I need to put it in every couple of hours and that's just how it is. Plasmatic asks uh, Ronnie if the birds are seagulls. I don't know. Here we go. The occurrence border came out of the warp at the coordinates where way station Alimentum Octavus was supposed to be found mm. and found the station to be missing. In its place, there was a pitched space battle being fought between an Imperial vessel and an... Oh, thank you so much, Slacker, for reminding me. Uh, Slacker says, Pugmaldus, 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 Pugmaldus. Um, if you guys do not know, and I don't know if I've said this a thousand times or not, my uh, one of my pugs is going to have puppies, and she'll be having puppies at the end of next month. So... Be expecting a ridiculous amount of refurbished cuteness on the channel because I'm going to have the babies. I'm going to be sitting here with the babies because they're adorable. Pug puppies are adorable. But right now she is a bowling ball of fury. An unidentifiable you, Zenos ship. A quick inspection of the system turned up the missing station farther back in its orbit of the local star than it should have been. In fact... A quick scan revealed that it wasn't in an orbit at all. It was moving in a nice straight line right down the gravity well. Oh. The captain estimated it had passed the point of no return about four hours ago and would start burning in about 30. He refused to speculate on what sort of weapon or magic could just cancel an entire station's orbital velocity. As for the ships, our initial instinct to go help the Imperial vessel was quelled by the captain. He reminded everyone that the only way the occurrence border would win a naval engagement was if the other ship spontaneously exploded before it <laughs> fired its first broadside. If it exploded afterward, the fight would probably be a draw. Right. Furthermore, the ship was looking less and less like it needed our help the longer we looked at it. It was definitely a lot bigger than its opponent, and was throwing out a staggering amount of firepower. Sure, it seemed to be missing the smaller ship with every shot, nice. but nothing the Xenos was throwing out made it past their void shields. And it was squawking stuff like 101001101 for chaos 101001101 across all Vox channels, and the astropath refused to tell anyone what he was hearing. Yeah. The tech priest on duty on the bridge had immediately declared them to be heretics, then had left his really? post to go talk to the other cogboys. No one bothered to stop him. It was really looking like our best option was to just jump right back out of the system and head somewhere less creepy. Yeah, just let the Chaos and the Eldar fight it out. It seems like a good idea. That's certainly what the captain recommended anyway. Mm. Except there was the tempting little matter of the station. It was the only thing in the system those ships could possibly be fighting over. And neither was in a position to stop us from taking a quick look. <laughs> it was a stupid, stupid idea. Yes, it and sounds it's stupid. it's a miracle we survived. The captain had stubbornly refused to get any closer to either the station or the fighting ships than necessary. The occurrence border was positioned at nearly the maximum distance from the station its shuttles could travel, and sat there with its engines and warp drive spun up. That sounds like a good words, idea. If anyone even looks at me funny, I'm leaving all you stupid bastards to die. That's a good idea too. With those encouraging words ringing in our ears, 
everyone boarded their shuttles and went to see what was so special about the way station Alimentum Octavus. It says something about how distracted everyone was that we were cruising for about a quarter of an hour before we realized Jim was the one flying and Hannah was the co-pilot. Oh. The reunion was sort of spoiled by the little note taped to the cockpit door saying, The shuttle is monitored. Talk and move as little as possible. Wait for us to give the word. Oh. After a long and awkward wait, Jim finally came back and announced that he'd looped something or other and we could talk. Hannah refused to leave the cockpit, even though we promised Tink wouldn't do anything weird. No, the sheer... F I don't blame her for not leaving because she... Straight up, like, if... That's just creepy. He, If you don't know, if you don't remember what I'm talking about, Tink named the drone Hannah 2.0. Amy opened the conversation with a polite, What the hell is going on here, you metal bastard? <laughs> but relented when Sarge vouched for Jim as the broest of cog bros. Yes. The explanation that followed was quick. Obviously well rehearsed and fairly terrifying. Yay! The gist of it was that the ship's tech priests weren't just antsy. They were on the edge of mutiny. Jim hadn't seen the actual data they'd pulled out of the Majos, but whatever this piece of archaeotech was, it had practically driven his seniors to a schism. Some of the cog boys wanted the tech destroyed, others wanted it locked away, and a few wanted to study it. The only thing that prevented an immediate free-for-all was the fact that the thing wasn't here, and that the Majos had reported it to someone named Juris. The senior tech priests had eventually agreed to wait for Juris to decide and abide by his decision. Unless, that is, it looked like the Archaeotech might fall into someone else's hands. Like, say, the Inquisitions. Mm. Uh, thank you, Aquila. Aquila says, if I were female and Mechanicus, I wouldn't get anywhere close to Tink either. Not without a strong electroshocker aimed at sensitive parts. Yes, yeah, uh-huh. Like, that was just creepy. I heard that, and I was just like, hey, look, dude, what the fuck? Less holy men, such as us or Jim, might see the ship's <laughs> senior tech priests as arrogant. Yeah. Socially stunted. And Very. quite possibly insane. Definitely. But they were not stupid. They knew we'd keep chasing the Archaeotech and would allow us to continue. For now. Mm -hmm. but we're monitoring all the team's shuttles and comms. If any of us found information relating to the Archaeotech or its location, we'd be given a single chance to turn it over. If we refused, Jim and the tech priests piloting the other shuttles had orders to cut our comms and return to the ship. Leaving all three teams to cook on the falling station. There's a statement in War Thunder that says, um... If you've ever played War Thunder, uh, teammates are just enemies with blue names. And that's the Mechanicus for you in this particular instance. In his words, the Majos Juris must decide this matter. Anything else would result in a schism. When the Mechanicus schisms, Titans walk and worlds burn. That's usually My superiors a will see you all dead before they allow that. After everyone had digested this speech for a while, Nubby put on his weaseliest smile and asked Jim if he'd really do that to his old pals. Yes. The flat look he got back from the engine seer was incredibly worrying, <laughs> especially coupled with how Jim turned around and went back into the cockpit without <laughs> seeing anything else. Yeah, he would. So anyway, that's why when we finally reached the station... Our team decided to stay in the shuttle while the others went Thank ahead. You, they could probably handle anything in there without us. Sarge loudly announced to the other teams that he intended to do visual inspection of the station. You know, for space... stuff. Yeah. The other interrogators agreed it was a good idea, but none of us thought of it as anything more than an excuse to not get marooned on a rapidly falling chunk of metal by crazy cogboys. 
So it was quite a surprise when we cleared a corner and saw the Heretech shuttle already docked to the station. Yay! We managed to call in the sighting just in time to keep the other teams from blundering into a bunch of heavily armed servitors and a tentacly tech priest. According to Battleaxe and Sword Guy, the Heretech seemed to be searching for something, stopping and doing creepy stuff to every cogitator or comm terminal he encountered. They decided that following the search party and seeing what it turned up was the best use of their time, and switched their teams to stealth mode. I got a feeling after this mission that Tank is going to practically destroy every servitor in existence, if not the entire team, because of their prior experience on the occurrence border, uh, on the occurrence border with servitors. Thank you, Slacker. Yes, Slacker says this is a good quote at the very least. When the Mechanicus schisms, Titans walk and worlds burn. That is a good quote. Jackson Eagle is here. Hey, Jackson. We wished them luck and continued our inspection. Now this is where some less imaginative Thank people you, would have blown up the docked shuttle. But we were suspicious bastards. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, a little more searching turned up nearly a dozen more shuttles. All of them heavily armed, but dormant for now. Oh, God. In our professional opinions, 12 to 3 wasn't good odds. No. Even without factoring in how much better armed they were than us. Yes. So Sarge decided to let the sleeping shuttles lie and called in a warning to the ground teams, advising them not to engage. Battleaxe interrupted and asked him to the repeat the message. It was hard to hear over all the shooting. Luckily, Sarge's facepalm turned out to be premature. Neither ground team was actually involved in the battle, they oh. were just watching as some third party shot seven types of hell out of the patrol. The question of who the hair attacks were fighting was answered by the sight of a familiar laser cannon beam stabbing out the station's hull a short distance away. Eldar. Amy summed up everyone's opinion of this development with an incredible streak of swearing. Different people are curious about different things. Sword Guy was wondering what sort of convoluted plot the Eldar were running. Battleaxe was curious about what the Heretech were looking for in the Cogitators. Our team didn't worry about that sort of complex bullshit. <laughs> we just wanted to know how the Eldar had gotten onto the station, because we sure as hell didn't see any other shuttles out here. Thanks to the adepts, we all knew the pointy-eared bastards like to use fancy, hidden, teleporting web dealies to get around. That's... But that's not the sort of thing you find tucked into the corner of a human way station. Okay. Either their teleporters had range from where their ship was duking it out with the Herotex, which Jim claimed was incredibly unlikely, or someone was trying to be sneaky. Guardsmen don't like it when other people are sneaky. It typically ends with us getting shot in the back. This happens. So we decided to take a harder look at the station. Since we didn't want to alert anyone to our presence out here, our moderately untrustworthy pilots did what they called a passive scan. Okay. We understood this to be the equivalent of looking real hard at something, but not going so far as to throw a rock at it to check for mines. Unfortunately, while it didn't blow our cover, it also didn't turn up anything. Sarge was debating ordering some figurative rock throwing when Tink announced that it was time to use some real scanners built by real scientists. Jim hastily leaned out and tapped his you are being monitored sign before Tink finished pulling off Spot's skulls. Oh my god. There was an awkward sort of pantomimed argument in which Jim managed to convey that he couldn't turn the cameras off again, and Tank managed to convey that Jim was a colossal metal asshole. <laughs> in the end, Tank wound up putting on his void helmet and stepping out the lock with his drone before pulling off its disguise. Since no one had anything better to do, we all clustered around the little airlock window and tried to watch over Tank's shoulder. You know, this is kind of poetic. Tank is going out the airlock, and this is kind of sad because... He isn't going out the airlock without a suit on. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Slacker. Uh, Slacker says, It's the Eldar. Contact the Salamanders, gather marshmallows, and toast their corpses, and watch the show. Yes. 
Mr. Yeah, Mr. Wright. They don't. I don't think they have fumbles right now. Um. Thank you, Slacker. I do not think the Eldar have refurbished teleporters. I really don't. I think they have the top of the line stuff. Uh, the Mechanicus, on the other hand, and the, the Dark Mechanicus in particular, they would have refurbished teleporters. And, the, of course, the Orcs would have refurbished everything. Thank you, Slacker. It wasn't very interesting. All we could see was him poking at his Xenos data slate and muttering to himself. Herbs and spices. The real action was happening down below us, where the drone engaged its stealth field and started taking some very close looks at the station and shuttles. Whether it was due to Tink having a bit of experience looking for Eldar with his drone, or pure dumb luck, or because Tau drone tech was really just that good, he found a shuttle that was not like the others in just under five minutes. Oh. This did not please Jim, no. who had to endure Tink making faces at him through the cockpit window as he relayed the drone's data. The refurbishment joke in the chat is real, guys. What appeared to be a fairly standard, if gruesomely decorated, Imperial-style shuttle to our eyes looked like a bat-winged Xenos craft to spot the Wonder Drone. It had sharp, forward-swept wings with odd chunks missing, and these weird, mandible-looking wings under the cockpit. But that wasn't what really caught our attention. What really caught our attention was the two massive laser cannons slung under it. It's Drukari? This thing didn't just have our shuttle's little wing turrets outclassed. It had us completely outschooled. Tink very carefully parked his drone Drukari. above the Xenos shuttle, and a quick debate over what to do about it was held. It says something about how shaken we were by Jim's little warning that we went with Nubby's idea. Oh, God. Uh, Phalius says, ask, Commissar, are guardsmen allowed to eat Eldar? Are they too human? Like, there's a reason things are called corpse starch, my friend. So no shit, there we were. So no shit, there we were. Hovering over a camouflaged Xenos attack shuttle, carrying more firepower than any three of our birds, and instead of running away or trying to destroy it before it realized we were there, we were trying to figure out how to steal it. <laughs> the long warp voyage out to this backwater sector must have rotted our brains. Yes. Quite aside from how stupidly dangerous an idea this was, it had absolutely nothing to do with why we'd come out here in the first place. In the station below us, the other two teams had just engaged the Heretech forces in an effort to take a captive and figure out what the hell they were doing here. In space above us, two incredibly dangerous ships were locked in a brutal dogfight while our own, completely combat and capable ship nervously watched from the sidelines. Somewhere across the Immaterium, an unknown Archaeotech device was cutting a swath of destruction towards Imperial space. And yet, our primary concern was nicking this fancy-looking Xenos shuttle. Possibly while its owners were busy shooting up our companions. I don't get it. Truly, we were the pinnacle of inquisitorial professionalism. Do what you gotta do. It, you know, they're say, they say that, you know, we're just looking to steal the shuttle. They're cutting off their enemy's path to escape. That's one way to spin it. Really wasn't our fault, though. The tech priests were obviously to blame. Yes. If they hadn't been plotting to maroon us in space, we wouldn't have felt nearly so motivated to acquire an alternate means of transportation. And you gotta do that. When you combine that sort of threat with the opportunity offered by an incredibly valuable unattended vehicle, heretical Xenotech though it may be, it's entirely unreasonable to expect a poor guardsman to resist temptation. Secure in the knowledge that our behavior was completely and totally justifiable, we prepped there for our breaching tools and formed up in our shuttle's airlock. Twitch provided some cutting charges, which were carefully placed using the drone's little servo arm. When everything was in place, Jim, who'd eventually stopped trying to convince us to do something saner, flew <laughs> us as close as he could without alarming any hostile shuttles. 
A trio of his little skulls were deployed and leashed like sled dogs. Then he departed and left us drifting in space above the holographically disguised shuttle. All things considered, it was a very good thing that Twitch was up to date on his meds and Fumbles wasn't feeling particularly nervous. Okay, so Fumbles is there. The skulls hauled us across the gap as, just outside of our line of sight, the charges went off and the shuttle's bay depressurized. As the last breath of air leaked out, our five-man, one-woman team zipped in. We crossed into the grav field and landed inside the shuttle with weapons ready. Just like the trained professionals we supposedly were. There you go. Well, at least five of us did. Whether it was due to her injured hand or because she wasn't used to performing these sorts of shenanigans, Amy missed her mark and wound up caroming off the hull. <laughs> Everyone turned to watch as she spun off into space. Oh, yeah. Swearing a blue streak as the skulls raced out to catch her. Nice. All of us were so distracted that we were nearly pushed out after her when a gust of wind suddenly hit us in the back. A gust of wind? Our squad turned around expecting to see, then shoot, some effeminate Xenos. Instead, a pair of big scarecrow-looking things with fish-shaped heads were standing there staring at us. At least we thought they were staring at us. No. The damn things didn't have eyes. No. Their weapons were certainly pointed our way, though, yes. which was what really mattered. Now, fighting in a vacuum is odd. Nothing sounds right. You can feel and sort of hear your weapons firing through your arms, but the shots don't make a sound. It's amazing how much you rely on little audio cues in a battle. It was hard as hell to tell how many shots we were firing, and even harder to tell if they were hitting. Oddly, it was almost as if we'd lost exactly 10% of our ballistic skills due to the unfamiliar terrain. <laughs> We coped, though, and poured a torrent of lays and plasma fire into the two hostels. Surprisingly, the fish-headed Xenos didn't seem too bothered by our barrage. They just soaked our fire and slowly tracked their weapons onto us. Then everything went funny. Not ha-ha funny, yeah, rather, I whoa, I can taste the color purple with my ears <laughs> funny. As the feeling washed over us, we scattered, and a pair of large orbs appeared. One orb formed right between Twitch and Sarge, while the other appeared above the now-prone form of Nubby. For a split second, we could hear something beyond understanding, but not horror in the spheres. Okay, Declonius, I'm going to catch you up real quick. So, they arrived in system, they arrived in system to basically... Uh, board a ship and look for some archaeotech that the Mechanicus was saying, you know, may cause a schism within the Mechanicus, you know, Titans walking, you know, things blowing up, all that kind of nonsense. And they were doing a rather good job of, like, trying to find stuff out until they found out that there was chaos, you know, you know, chaos Mechanicus there. And then, uh, while they were looking for that, they figured out the Eldar were on there, and now they found an Eldar shuttle. So they decided to go away from the main mission to basically steal an Eldar shuttle. Welcome to the All Guardsman Party. I don't know. They've already stolen an Ekron shuttle. Let's go. Then, with a pop that could somehow be heard through the vacuum, the orbs disappeared and took two perfectly circular chunks of bulkhead with them. That's not nice. We all just stood there and stared for a second. Hobbit then fumbles started. Thank you, Hobbit. Hobbit says my immersion is broken. It's screaming. None of us had liked what we'd seen when the Xenos had fired their weapons. No. Whatever those things did looked a lot worse than just getting shot. Yes. But fumbles had a stronger reaction than the rest of us. Oh. The little psychers screaming ratcheted up to a shriek, then kept going until it started bouncing around inside our heads. That's not a good sign. Now. There are several, relatively normal things that are a bad idea to do in a void suit. Vomiting traditionally heads this list, followed by crying, sneezing, and a few other things depending on whether your model has waste disposal systems. Uh-huh. Anyway, if someone ever revises that list, 
Using a psychic shriek could probably be added somewhere near the top. Mm. Now, not being a psyker, I can't properly say whether it was a matter of the shout building up inside his helmet until something gave, oh. or if it just punched through his faceplate on the way out towards its target. Either way, we all felt a wave of panic roll over us as the shriek was cut off by what sounded like a burst of wind. A helmet's worth of air and a hail of plastic slammed into the two Xenos monstrosities along with the psychic attack. Where their combined force did exactly jack shit. <laughs> Fumbles landed on his ass, frantically clawing at his ruined helmet and radiating pants-wetting terror to the entire squad. Good job. Unlike our past experience with the Psyker's aura, this wasn't distracting, annoying, or disturbing. This was incapacitating. Oh, great. By all rights, we should have died right there. Stumbling around in an attempt to escape a sourceless fear. But two things saved us. The first thing was Twitch, who shrugged off the aura <laughs> of fear like it was nothing. Of course, it's he Twitch. He sprinted across the room to Fumbles, pulling off his explosives-filled pack on the way. He jammed the bag over the psyker's head and pulled its drawstrings causing the bag to inflate like an incredibly dangerous balloon. The aura of terror reduced in intensity as Fumble's inability to draw a breath was reduced by claustrophobic darkness and the fact that someone was partially strangling him. <laughs> X in the chat for Twitch being quick on the screen. That's awesome. A slacker. Thank you, slacker. Slacker says, do not get into a sacker fight with an Eldar. Nine out of ten times, the night fears win. And this is true. This is very true. Thank you, slacker. Oh, God. Twitch is the man. The second thing was that the fish-headed Xenos were some sort of retarded. One of them fired a shot at Twitch as the trooper sprinted across the bay and missed by a scarily small margin. Mm-hmm. The other casually walked up the open hole in the bay and just sort of vacantly stared out of it. It didn't stop to shoot anyone on the way, or even try to step on Nubby who was lying half a meter from where it stopped. It was definitely one of the more bizarre things we'd seen on a battlefield. Or, it would have been if we'd been in any condition to see anything. As the aura faded and we acclimated to the unusual feeling of someone else's terror raging through our minds, mm. everyone got to their feet. We were greeted by the sight of one Xenos reading his insanity orb cannon for another shot, and the other spacing out at the edge of the hole we'd entered through. That's always a relatively good sign that there's two of them. I don't think... I don't think these are Wraith Guard. I can't remember what the human size variants of them, but I thought the Wraith Guard were rather large. Aquila, thank you. Poor Fumbles, being trapped with half of Twitch's ordnance in a small, tight, dark space is only marginal better than choking on a vacuum. This is also true. Do you guys think Twitch booby traps his own bag of explosives? I think he would. Considering. And I just lost all hearing in my left ear. It's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Quill. I appreciate it, bud. Uh, yeah. Wraith Guard are one of those... Like, the first time I ever saw Wraith Guard, I was like, wow, that actually looks awesome. Um, Arnoux says, Bossman, if they send an astro message saying they're tracking a warband calling themselves the Fallen, how long before Dark Angels? Um, yes. Yes, that's the answer. This is where your normal group of heroic badasses would have opened fire in an effort to kill the Xenos before they could fire again. Uh-huh. Not we didn't even try that. No. See, our attacks, plasma and hotshot laser gun alike, Thank you to Colonius. hadn't so much as phased these assholes. It was time to try something new. Yay. Sarge shouted his orders and threw himself at the Xenos cannon, grabbing onto it like a big disgruntled monkey hanging from a branch. <laughs> to Sarge's dismay, the fish head turned out to be more than strong enough to hold up both him and the weapon. Luckily, the way Sarge was flailing around completely spoiled the Xenos' aim, and the next hell orb appeared in the middle of the bay's floor. 
While Sarge kept his target off our backs, the rest of us turned to the one near the hole. Tink and Twitch stepped backwards, lowered their heads, and charged straight at the Xenos' back. That works. Down on the floor, Nubby hastily crawled towards the hostel, then flipped onto his back. At this point, the fish head seemed to remember that it was in the middle of a battle and started to turn to face us. Embrace monkey. He wasn't fast enough, though. Two charging guardsmen hit the Xenos in the side at the same moment as a pair of augmetic legs launched upwards. <laughs> as body checks went, they weren't the best. Both soldiers were on the wiry side, and the best word to describe the Xenos' size and weight is hulking. Okay. Combined with the lifting force of Nubby's legs, though, it was just enough. In a sort of slow-motion ballet, the fish head tumbled forwards. Right out the hole, we blasted into the bay's wall. Nice. Amy was being hauled back towards the shuttle by Jim's skulls and spot, who she was riding like some sort of demented horse. As she neared the hole, something big and rather confusing looking launched out of it, okay. causing her to swear and nearly fall off her mount. After she regained her composure, she watched as the thing tumbled into the void, slowly spinning as it drifted away. When it didn't do anything, she dismissed it as not her problem and raised her new rifle as the shuttle's interior finally came into view. Yes. Back inside the bay, the Xenos had gotten tired of Sarge dangling off its... Wait a minute. So they've been shooting... There's a bunch of holes in this cargo bay, and so if they actually steal it, they're going to have to bring it back and they're going to have to repair it. So technically, they're stealing this Eldar shuttle to refurbish it. I hate myself some days. It's weapon. It grabbed one of the struggling non-com's arms in a dinner plate sized hand and inexorably pried him off of its weapon. Sarge found himself suspended in the air, or vacuum as it were, facing away from the angry Xenos. He flailed as hard as he could in an attempt to break its grip and failed miserably. Sarge then grabbed his slung laser gun and tried to fire it over his shoulder. It was wrenched from his hand before he got more than a single burst off. Finally, in desperation, he reached for his grenades, which were pretty high on the list of stupid weapons to use in a vacuum. Yes! Perhaps luckily, he wasn't able to grab one before his free arm was grabbed by the Xenos' other hand. It raised him in the air, then slowly inexorably began to spread its arms, and by extension, Sarge's apart. The first thing Amy saw as she rose over the edge of the hole was Fumbles, sitting there and clawing at the backpack full of high explosives tied over his head. This was odd, but not an immediate problem. The second thing, or things, were three of her squad mates running around like idiots and screaming about not being able to get a clear shot. How is this different than any other time? The third thing was her new boss being pulled apart like a wishbone by a three meter tall Xenos. Mm -hmm. Amy sighted her rifle, waited a beat for Sarge's legs to swing out of the way, then put a burst of plasma right through the monstrosity's shoulders. Good. In a perfect universe, the fish head's arm would have fallen off, and Sarge would have beat it around the head and neck with its own severed limb. Yes. Unfortunately, this is not. in our reality, the arm just went limp while the hand still retained its vice like grip on Sarge's. Also, both of Sarge's shoulders were dislocated, and he uh. was too busy screaming to beat anyone around the anything. Ugh. We tried not to let our disappointment show as Sarge merely flopped to the side and left us a clear shot at the Xenos. Three hotshot laser guns, a plasma gun, and a pulse rifle poured precision fire into the Xenos's thin middle section. The combined weight of fire did what our earlier barrages couldn't, and with a soundless snap, the bastard collapsed in two separate pieces. 
Sarge swore loudly as he landed and informed everyone that the Xenos' grip was not getting any looser. Since the fish head seemed rather hard to kill, most things lose their spunk after being cut in half, you know. Everyone stepped forward and concentrated their fire on its shoulders. That finally did the trick and we pulled Sarge free. Took a while to pry the severed arms off of his wrists, though. Talk about a death grip. Mm. We all stood there, contemplating our success and wondering what to do about Sarge's shoulders when Fumbles finally caught our attention. His comm wasn't functional and we couldn't hear him, but he managed to send a rough psychic message out. He was wondering if the fight was over and we could go somewhere with air now. Yes. The bag was nice and all, but he was pretty sure at least one of the mines in there was armed. <laughs> Twitch winced, then he and Tink got to work on the door that the two fish heads had come through. They had to push the Xenos severed torso out of the way to get access. It didn't do anything when Tink kicked it, but it somehow managed to glare reproachfully despite not having eyes, or any real face for that matter. While the more technical side of the team got the door open, Jim's Metascull floated in and took a look at Sarge. It sort of poked around in a confused manner, trying to figure out how to get at Sarge's shoulders. After a while, its little machine spirit must have reached a decision, because it deployed a syringe and tried to jab Sarge with it. The puncture-proof void suit turned out to be stronger than the skull expected. After a bit of straining, it broke the needle and whacked into Sarge's shoulder, triggering an impressive amount of cursing. <laughs> the Metascull got even more agitated at this failure and deployed its little circular saw. The one we had last seen it use to decapitate the Majos. None of us really knew if it had decided to harvest Sarge's head, or just wanted to cut through his void suit while he was in a vacuum, so it could deliver its painkiller shot. Yes. Either way, Nubby and- Hey, you're gonna suffocate to death and your eyes are gonna turn inside out, but you won't feel it. Amy fended the skull off with the butts of their weapons until the door was finally opened. Jim was very apologetic about the whole thing, but we still didn't let the skull follow us into the pressurized section of the shuttle. It's gonna cut its way in. Once the door was closed... Here we go, Zero Tech Heresy Part 5. X is in the chat, we're going on. ...and Twitch had carefully removed the bag full of explosives from Fumble's head, we looked around our new shuttle. The room where we'd fought the fish heads had just been a moderately roomy troop compartment. Nothing interesting in there. This room was definitely some sort of command center. It wasn't filled with Vox units, cogitators, and random uninsulated wires like an Imperial command center, but the hollow thingy displaying a map of the station in the middle of the room was a dead giveaway. Thank you, Aquila. Aquila says, isn't that the ad mech in a nutshell? Very logical until you consider context. This is very true. <laughs> this is absolutely true. A <laughs> guy under a bridge says distant skull thumping noises. <laughs> that thing's going to be in there. Oh, and the wraith guard that got thrown out. Guys, don't think it's going to be out there forever. Don't think it's going to be out there forever. It's going to enter into a degrading orbit into the sun, and eventually that Eldar will burn. Yes. And it won't take that long either. Yes. Unfortunately, though, we will not be able to, you know, do the Vulcan's 11 Herbs and Spices because Wraithbone isn't exactly that great. You know, maybe a dog toy? I don't know. Dog toys? Thank you, Aquila. Thank you, Guy on Bridge. That was a Sotha Sil says that was clearly a refurbished skull. Despite its tasteful decor and abundant air supply, the command room made us uneasy. It had a short hallway leading to the shuttle's cockpit, but none of us saw any hatches connected to the station. In fact, the only exit we'd seen was the one on the rear, and it hadn't been connected to anything. Mm. 
The question of how the Zenos got aboard the station, and which direction they'd be coming from if they tried to take their shuttle back, hung in the air like a wet fart in a tank. That is, that, that's disgusting. <coughs> Thank you, Slacker. Slacker says, funny thing, most cut, bullet, and puncture-proof clothes rely on the hardness of the material behind it. Sarge's shoulder outdid a servo skull. You know, I didn't know that, Slacker. Is that, is that, like, is that, like, across the board with puncture, like, puncture-resistant material? The, I did not know that. And if that's the case, that just makes me want to do some research. Just based off what, because that's wild. Um, Dicolonia says, aren't server skulls and servers in general just refurbished failures? This refurbished thing. <laughs> this refurbished thing. Thank you, Slacker. I, I now I'm gonna have to go do research because I didn't know that and I want to figure out more. I really do. Hard to ignore and holding the potential to become a serious problem. From the elegant but rather uncomfortable chair he'd found near the map, Sarge reminded everyone about how the Xenos were supposed to use teleporting webs to get around. Yes, or Spider-Man. A brief search of the shuttle didn't turn up anything that looked like a teleportarium, or was particularly web-shaped. The closest we got was a Xenos rune that looked sort of like a spider. Nick Fulton says, now they need to refurbish this Eldar ship. Very true. They're going to wind up doing it. They blast enough holes into it. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Twitch put a mine on it, just to be safe. Then put a mine on everything else, just to be safer. None of us stopped him. It was really the only defensive option we could think of. Right. While Twitch saw the perimeter, Tink got to work on figuring out how to fly our new piece of loot. Amy checked- Are we sure these aren't orcs, and we've just been listening to, like, a fantasy, kind of like the Emperor? Din with the other teams, and Nubby called Doc for some medical advice. Sarge later complained bitterly about how many tries it had taken to relocate his shoulders. But neither Nubby nor Fumbles had any medical training, and there was a lot of distortion on the comm channel. Anyway, the way he kept yelling was very distracting, and the second one only took two tries. Yay. So all his whining wasn't really justified. <laughs> After the little medical procedure was finished, a quick council of war was held. Amy reported that the other teams were just killing a lot of servitors, not making any real progress towards finding useful intel. Mm -hmm. Jim followed that up with a report that the tech priests hadn't given any new orders, but claimed they were very interested in our shuttle. Based on all that, Sarge's vague plan was for us to call off the station part of the mission before anyone did something crazy. And okay. Bloody Magpie just gave me, like, seriously, this is, these are orcs. These are not guardsmen. They have to be orcs because Bloody Magpie just said it. Listen to the names. Doc, Sarge, Cutter, Nubby, Tink, Heavy. All these names and fly the Eldar shuttle back to the occurrence border. From there, the adepts, and possibly the cog boys, could search it for clues or whatever. The only real problem with this plan was that, right, compared bro, to nice Imperial, day, or Tau systems for that matter, Eldar tech was almost impossible to understand. Kinda like the Eldar. Tink was working hard and kept claiming that he'd nearly figured it out. But so far, he'd only managed to turn the lights on and off. Eldar Tech works kind of like Zinch in text-to-speech, even for like an on-off button. So if you go to press the on button, it starts asking you existential questions like, what is on really? Maybe it's just a manifestation of our implicit desire to see something function. For hours on end. While Tink tinkered and occasionally asked for advice from Jim and Old Bill, I did forget Chris. the rest Sorry, of us kept correct. busy. Amy watched the perimeter with Twitch, Sarge poked at the hollow map, and Nubby and Fumbles were assigned prisoner duty. 
prisoner in this case meant the severed Xenos torso. They taped the thing to the wall and, at Twitch's request, drew a face on its blank head so it didn't look so creepy. <laughs> at Nubby's urging, Fumbles was They're adding orcs. some embellishments to their artwork, when a section of wall slid outwards and a tall, lithe, and familiar-looking Xenos appeared out of thin air. Yay. The Eldar warlock scanned the room, then began to say something. He was immediately interrupted by Twitch shouting that a hostile had breached the perimeter and raising his laser gun. The Xenos tried to resume speaking, only to be interrupted again as Twitch asked for permission to fire. Sarge, who'd nodded off, jerked awake just in time to hear the frustrated Eldar snap. Foolish Monkai, you can't shoot me, I'm a... Then Twitch got tired of waiting and opened up on full auto. <laughs> there are times when an inquisitorial agent, military commander, or Twitch imperial diplomat animal, will negotiate with one of the hated Xenos and discover that they really aren't all that bad. Then they wind up working together to fight some common foe, in a sort of polite but distant working relationship based on mutual respect is formed. Yeah, they're not here. This was not one of those times. No. <laughs> it took the warlock about five tries to finish saying hologram. You know, honestly, Mr. Reich, Mr. Reich says, at least it's a warlock and not a farseer. If it was a farseer, I'd be like, at least you should have seen this coming. Twitch kept shooting him every time he started talking. <laughs> when the demolitions trooper finally ran out of ammo, the incredibly frustrated Eldar exploded into a lecture on how holograms work and why it was pointless to shoot them. <laughs> he was interrupted halfway through as Nubby shot him, turned towards Sarge and reported that the Xenos appears to be some sort of hologram. Oh, I don't think we can shoot him. The Eldar swore in its fancy language and asked Sarge to control his ape creature. Whereupon Twitch finished reloading and shot him at the while Nubby loudly told Sarge that the Xenos was getting pissy. Things only went downhill I from there. Love this. <laughs> I can't I can't Thank you, Slacker. Twitch doesn't fuck around when he wants someone dead. He also loves what he does with a debt pack. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I can't imagine being that elder right now. <laughs> oh, this is the best thing. <laughs> Thank you, Slacker. <laughs> They're horns! They're horns! It's the only explanation that fits. Oh god. I'm done. I'm done. She <laughs> That's the dumb. I can't. I'm just like in my head. I'm in. <sighs> I don't feel sorry for him because he's a fucking nightmare fuck. <laughs> the level of frustration. <laughs> you pop in as a hologram only to have them start unloading. You explain how a hologram works when they're still unloading. <laughs> oh. oh my god, okay. <laughs> I need a minute. It's the dumbest thing I've said. Oh my god. Oh. Okay. <laughs> oh. Oh. All right. All right. All right. <laughs>
I don't know why this has got me so good. Oh, let me catch back up with a couple of these super chats and then I'll continue on with this nonsense. If they pull out a crack grenade launcher, I'm going to lose my shit. <sighs> Slacker says, Twitch doesn't fuck around when he wants someone to... Uh, yeah, I that one. Thank you, Slacker. I really appreciate it. Hobbit says, continually shooting holograms. Yes, they are. Thank you, Hobbit. This is so damn true. <laughs> Nick Fulton says, when you can't match them, so you pull them down to the bloody mud pit with you to talk intentionally or not. <laughs> <laughs> This more looks like I'm not getting paid enough for this shit. Thank you, Nick. Aquila says you have, you almost have to feel sorry for him. Almost. No. Fuck him. Thank you, Aquila. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I love this. Mr. Rex is old man. He is. Shut down. Oh, it says break time. <laughs> we need to refurbish old man dot exe. I'm fucked. <laughs> no, I'm not good. <laughs> Thank you. Give me a minute. I don't know why this has got me so bad. I'm hot. I'm crying. The middle imagery of this. Oh my god. <laughs> Sack hologram this. Oh my god. This is ridiculous. Oh. <coughs> oh my god. Alright. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Go turn on the AC. <laughs> Hmm. All right, here we go. <laughs> the warlock was an arrogant bastard. He tried to order us around, but none of us had even the slightest intention of returning to our wretched vessel or leaving matters beyond our comprehension to our betters. The diplomatic breakdown was total. On our side of the table, Amy had a serious axe to grind, Nubby was just nubby, mm -hmm. Sarge's shoulders hurt like a bitch, <laughs> and everyone else just didn't give a shit. As for the warlock, he loudly declared us to be idiot children playing with deadly weapons, both personally and as a race. <laughs> the Eldar had probably intended to either use his moral superiority to get us to leave his ship, or That's cut some work. sort of deal with us. That's not gonna work the yet. problem was that he kept getting bogged down in pointless arguments, petty insults, and fits of frustrated anger. <laughs> Everyone. Can you blame him? Even Fumbles was doing something that might as well have been scientifically designed to outrage the prissy Xenos. <laughs> to start with, Tink didn't even try to hide the fact that he was stealing the Eldar's <laughs> shuttle and occasionally asked him what a specific button did. This is fucked up. Hobbit says, Oh, if only the Warlock was Eldrad. Thank you, Hobbit. I wish this was Eldrad. I'd pay for this to be Eldrad. Amy only spoke when she'd thought of something particularly scathing to say to him. Okay. And while Twitch eventually stopped shooting the hologram, he'd occasionally <laughs> interrupt the warlock to insert his own rather unique theories into the conversation. Fumbles, who was admittedly acting on Nubby's orders, doodled on the captive fish-headed Xenos. <laughs> this caused a surprising amount of anger in the warlock. Despite how good the mustache and monocle he drew was, <laughs> all that was... He made the reed guard the spiffing Brit! Let's go! He refurbished the reed guard to the spiffing Brit! It's relatively minor compared to Nubby and Sarge, though. Mm. Nubby, for reasons beyond all logic, 
had appointed himself as the warlock's translator. <laughs> he shouted down or shot the holographic Xenos at the end of almost every sentence, then relayed his personal interpretation to Sarge. Our fearless leader took an evil delight in how much this annoyed the Eldar, and started only responding to Nubby's translations. <laughs> it was childish, antagonistic, incredibly unprofessional, and all according to a plan so devious that none of us even realized we were part of it. Well, at least okay. Sarge claimed it was his plan afterwards and no one was in any position to argue with the results. Are you shitting me? They should have They should have taken, like, if they had been filming this in any way, shape, or form, they should have seriously put this out as inquisitional re required visuals, like a required video for how to deal with Xenos. In his most cunning of minds, Sarge figured out that the warlock had us incredibly outclassed when it came to diplomacy. Really? The only person on our team that stood even a chance of holding their own was the old diplomat adept back on the ship. But with the cogboys monitoring the comms, bringing him in was out of the question. Hobbit says, after this big YouTube channel, old man refurbished. Therefore, the only way we could possibly come out ahead in a negotiation with an Eldar, oh, okay, who Ronnie. probably had hundreds of years' experience talking circles around Inquisitors and the like, was to drag him down to our level. Thank you, Hobbit. Now, the brilliance of Sarge's plan didn't end there. It is a well-known statement that you don't argue with idiots. They drag you down to their level and then beat you with experience. In addition to keeping the Eldar off balance, the behavior of the more eccentric members of our squad acted as a time-buying distraction for both Tink and the other teams. Every second the Warlock spent screaming at us in incoherent rage <laughs> was a second where he wasn't leading an attack on our shuttle this or sniping anyone in the station. This is very true. Admittedly, neither group was actually accomplishing anything useful with that time. Tink had found 13 different controls for the shuttle's lights, and last we heard the other teams, they were still killing endless waves of servitors. But they did have it. The incredibly uncivil discussion eventually rolled around to how stupid humanity's fascination with Archaeotech was. Our race's suicidal persistence in trying to keep the current peace from its owners was going to wind up gutting the entire sector's ability to fight off the next wave of Tyranids. Oh no! On top of that, if we somehow managed to keep it, we'd inevitably wind up destroying ourselves with it. Oh no! Any sane race would have let the Necrons have it. Or at least dropped it on some orc or Tyranid world that no one would miss. Sarge perked up at this piece of actual useful information. There we go. Then, when Nubby suggested his cunning new idea to drop the Archaeotech on some orc or Tyranid world that no one would miss, Sarge agreed that it was a good one. Mm-hmm. The Eldar paused mid-rant to boggle. <laughs> the incredulous warlock asked if we were serious. Sensing that the time was right, Sarge told Nubby to shut up and promised that he was super serious. We didn't want to use the Archaeotech. We didn't want to study the Archaeotech. No. And we certainly didn't want to fight Necrons, Emperor help us for the Archaeotech. As far as any of us was concerned, the metal bastards could have the thing. The Eldar sputtered, then asked about 15 different questions most of which he answered himself. We were obviously too stupid to lie, and we must have already known what the Archaeotech was. Otherwise, how'd we come to the system? Uh -huh. Furthermore, despite our appearance and behavior, we were obviously the ones in charge of the mission. Oh my god. After all, our team was the one in his shuttle, as opposed to fighting servitors on the station. Mm-hmm, let's keep no on digging this bullshit No one corrected these pile. assumptions. Yes? The only real question the Eldar had for us was why we wanted the Archaeotech destroyed. 
uh, BC, uh, BGC, vegan, v, v, BG, oh my God, there's too many consonants. BGC Vetton says, oh no, indeed, here comes the next God's goal. It's not going to surprise me. Yeah, that that's how they deal with problems in the Eldar. They just make a huge one for the rest of the galaxy. According you, to him, man. the five other Inquisitors and Magi he'd encountered, then killed, had all lusted after the device like it was mankind's salvation. Sarge nonchalantly suggested that we were just smarter than them. The warlock shot a pointed look at Nubby, who had a finger jammed up to the second joint in his nostrils. Nice. Then back at Sarge. Our fearless leader shrugged and adjusted that to less ambitious than them. There we go. Before anyone else could say anything to push the warlock back from confused to furious, mm -hmm. Sarge made his move. He pointed out how we only wanted to prevent any more planets being wiped out. We agreed with the Eldar. The Archaeotech either needed to be destroyed, turned over the Necrons, or sent out of Imperial space. So, he should just tell us where it was going next and we'd handle the rest. There'd be no working together bullshit. We'd leave as soon as we had our directions. And he'd never have to talk to us again. Oh, God. <laughs> the warlock started to say something, then stopped. And started again, then stopped again. Finally, he let out a very frustrated sigh and gave us directions to an imperial world whose governor had just purchased the Archaeotech. Well, the Eldar then told us to get off his shuttle before he orders his ship to disengage and let the heretics have the system, data records and all. Okay. Sarge took a second to ponder this last part of the deal and asked Tink how things were going. From up in the cockpit, Tink announced for the twentieth time that he'd figured out the controls and would be able to fly us away before anyone could stop us. He triumphantly pressed a few buttons, flipped a switch, and manually connected two wires. Once again, the shuttle completely failed the move, and the lights flicked off, then back on. Sarge told the warlock he could have his shuttle back. Twitch packed up his toys. Fumbles was given a less dangerous pack to use as a helmet. Yeah. Tink was forcefully pulled out of the cockpit and Nubby was told to empty his pockets. While everyone else packed up, Sergeant Amy debated the whole tech priest problem. It was eventually decided that there was no way to really hide the Archaeotech's location from them. Luckily, Amy was able to suggest a way to keep the Cogboys on our side for the time being. Always a good choice. Jim was called to pick us up, and over the monitored channel, Sarge reported the location of the Archaeotech. He also warned everyone that a sizable Heretech fleet was being gathered to seize it before the Mechanicus could confiscate it. So maybe we should try to get there and secure it first. That'd be it a good wasn't idea. very subtle, but hey, neither were we. And the Cogboys must have bought it because everyone's shuttles picked them up without any arguing or ultimatums. Everyone was feeling pretty happy about how the mission had went as we left the Eldar shuttle. In a fit of goodwill, Tink even pushed the fish head's limbs into a neat pile and left a note saying which way the second one had been drifting when we'd last seen it. <laughs> As Jim and Hannah flew us back to the airport's border, we looked back at the station we'd never gotten around to boarding. It was looking rather ragged. Its interior probably hadn't been designed to survive pitched fights involving anti-armor energy weaponry. Probably not. And the star behind it had gotten noticeably larger. We congratulated ourselves on not being stupid enough to board that death trap and watched the station shrink behind us. Right as it was getting too small to see anymore, there was a neat little fireworks display. We couldn't be sure, but the explosion seemed to match the locations of all the Heretech shuttles. That probably explained what the Eldar had been up to. Mm hmm. Our good moods lasted until Jim landed us in the Occurrence Border's main shuttle bay. 
We were the last team back, and the bay was a madhouse full of rushing people and horrible screams. Doc and his girlfriend were running around with their medical teams. From the look of it, they had quite a few customers, and Sarge detailed a few of us to lend a hand. Surprisingly, most of the screams weren't coming from Doc's patients. What had at first looked and sounded like a field surgery station turned out to be something weirder. Oh boy. Half a dozen of the senior cog boys were clustered together in a far corner of the bay. As we watched, a captive heretic was brought off a shuttle by some servitors and dragged into the group of tech priests. Oh, this is bad for him. There were some very good overall, bad for the heretic. The unsettling power tool noises Ooh. and a lot more screams. And Sarge asked Jim and Hannah what was going on. The two engine seers whispered to each other for a while, then said the tech priests were checking the captives for serial numbers. Apparently, they could be used to determine which cabal the heretics had come from. From there, the tech priests would research past records of the sort of technology the heretics had access to, giving us a major advantage when it came time to fight their fleet. They're just doing this out of spite. Sarge pondered the fact that there wasn't actually any heretic fleet. He then weighed that against how the screams seemed to indicate that the cogboys didn't believe in little things like sedation no. or killing people before dissecting them. No. In the end, he decided that this was not his problem. Good times rhymes with war crimes. And he really needed a drink. Or at least some painkillers for his shoulders. Better yet, a drink, and some painkillers, and someone to take off his void suit without him having to move his arms. In the end, he had to settle for just the painkillers. Everything else had to wait until after he talked with the captain, adepts, other interrogators, and whoever the tech priest sent to vaguely threaten everyone. <laughs> Sarge returned to our quarters hours later. Looking like shit and still wearing his void suit. Yikes. Our first few tries to remove his suit resulted in a lot of yelling and Nubby getting punted across the room. <laughs> in the end, Tink wound up just cutting him out while Amy held a bottle of liquor with a straw in it for him. <laughs> the gist of the situation was that oh, the Eldar God. ship had disengaged and vanished after the Heretech shuttles had been destroyed. The Heretech ship hadn't tried to chase us or catch up with the falling station. Instead, it had warped out shortly after the fight ended. The captain couldn't be sure, but it didn't look like it was heading in the same direction as us, and the scanners had been clear since we entered the warp ourselves. We were headed towards the coordinates the Eldar had given us, which turned out to be the planet with the shifty Governor Sword Guy had wanted us to go to. We won't hear about that again. Sarge said the other interrogator had been rather bitter over the whole thing. Yeah. Mostly on account of how he'd been shot in the gut twice during the station fight. Yes. Battleaxe wasn't in great shape either. They'd shed a lot of blood fighting off the servitors and capturing two heretics for interrogation. Inter Tensions were rather high due to the way the tech priests had seized those hard-won prisoners and vivisected them. <laughs> The Cogboys were not very apologetic for this, but at least they'd shared their info on this particular group of heretics with the rest of us. The Adepts were chewing through it and would be putting together some combat plans and stuff like that during the trip. The other info Sarge had relayed from the Warlock hadn't gone over well. To start with, everyone but the Tech Priests had given Sarge grief for not getting the actual details of the Archaeotech from the Eldar. He'd very politely told them where they could shove their complaints, then moved on to the matter of who was probably purging planets. Right. The revelation that it was Necrons chasing the Archaeotech, or at least that the Eldar said it was Necrons, had quieted everyone down. While it had been the smart bet in the pool ever since we'd learned this was all about a piece of Archaeotech, having it confirmed was fairly unpleasant. None of the other teams had fought them before, but between their training and the stories everyone had heard, they didn't need us to tell them that the Necrons were bad news. 
Okay, so just so I can elaborate something in this, um, we tend to forget a little bit about the Necrons as it pertains to, you know, everything. The Necrons as a target were very, like, they were beyond mysterious, and when they first started appearing, they would just destroy full fleets with no casualties. It was brutal. Um, the Necrons are just ungodly powerful, but, yeah, I'm shutting up. Moving on. The captain had reiterated his suggestion that we go somewhere safe, and request an entire fleet's worth of backup. Mm. Most of us thought that sounded like a great idea. Unfortunately, Sarge and the other interrogators thought otherwise. Okay. They believed that if we got there fast enough, we could do something to prevent Necrons from wiping out another planet and keep the Heretek fleet, which Sarge now regretted making up, from getting the Archaeotech. Of course, the exact details of what we'd do were still a bit fuzzy. The interrogator's only good ideas were to destroy the Archaeotech, or put it somewhere where the Necrons could take it without killing everyone. The tech priests had informed everyone that both those options would result in their grisly deaths. <laughs> the most they'd allow would be for us to set up a perimeter around the Archaeotech and plant a bomb which the ship's head tech priest would build and hold the detonator for. Mm. All the interrogators, even Sarge, had wound up agreeing to this. The captain had called them idiots, and since Sarge wasn't in any condition to hit us at the moment, we all agreed. The one saving grace of the interrogators' plans was that, being on the border and all, the planet we were heading towards had a fair-sized PDF and SDF. Between that and the detailed intel we could provide, there was a slim chance that we could hold off the Necrons until reinforcements arrived, or the tech priests stopped being assholes. The uh, emphasis on the slim. universe. Before Once again, we were happens. stuck traveling through the warp, and hoping like hell we'd arrive before everything went ploin-shaped. At least this time, we had a better idea of what was currently happening at our destination. The planet had a branch of the Telepathica, and the Astropath was able to keep tabs on their situation. The Adepts and the other teams spent a lot of time sending messages back and forth, looking for clues about where the Archaeotech was, and all that. We didn't trouble ourselves with any of that. Someone would tell if they found something important. For the time being, we had other stuff to do. Aside from the usual planning bullshit that Sarge had to put up with, we were able to dedicate our full efforts to some very important projects. Okay, well, one important project, a less important minor one, and a bit of entrepreneuring. The less important one was replacing Sarge's laser gun. When okay. the Xenos, which the adepts had told us were called a wraith guard, not a fish head, <laughs> had disarmed him, it had bent his laser gun like a banana. Oof. Since fruit-shaped weapons tend not to work well, and Amy's pulse rifle had performed so awesomely, Tink put all his effort into converting a Tau carbine for Sarge's use. Everyone else was moderately jealous. The other side project was, of course, Nubby's continual quest to not lose quite a bit of money in the betting pool. Fumbles revealed to the rest of us that during our last bit of travel time, they'd tracked down the only three people who'd bet on the Necrons, mm -hmm. then persuaded them to retract those bets. Oh, shit. All that was left was to convince the ship's quartermaster, who was the one actually holding the money and tracking the bets, to allow the withdrawal. Once that was done, there'd be no winning bets, and the money would surely default back to everyone. We left Nubby to his little plot, which seemed to revolve around getting some incriminating pictures of the Quartermaster. <laughs> We'd be getting our money back too, after all. So aside from that little stuff, all of our effort was put into the big important project. Operation Screw Everyone Else Over Before They Screw Us. Hey, that's always a good one. Now, this may sound like the default state we operated in, but this was a much more concerted effort than our usual paranoia and misanthropy. Our focus... 
The amount of Xenos tech in this in this squad right now is getting to the verge of disturbing. It is it's getting disturbing. This was almost entirely on two parties, the tech priests and the warlock. Now it's obvious why we felt the need to plot against the cog boys, with them acting nuttier than squirrel shit and all. Yeah, that's but the other part might need some explanation. Yes, it does. See, it is in the very nature of Eldar to dick honest, hard-working guardsmen over. They probably tell each other stories of great Eldar heroes who use their magical Xenos powers for absolutely nothing but being a colossal dick. Yes. Based on this single concrete fact about his basic nature, we knew that the warlock would A. Show up at the planet, B. Try to use us to destroy the Archaeotech, C. Proceed to dick us over as hard as he possibly could the second we were no longer useful. Mm -hmm. This may be a lot to infer from a single piece of racism, but it was backed up by our personal experience with the warlock. When we'd been talking with him over the hollow what's it, we'd gotten the distinct impression that he didn't like us for some reason. Really? Um... Hobbit, uh, thank you, Hobbit. He says the name of the episode should get to you then. Um, hmm? I'm trying to figure out uh, the name of the episode should get to you then, the Xenotech Heresy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 there's too much of it. Uh, thank you, Hobbit. That was a sure sign it's just, of a dickish personality. Well, they're Eldar. Anyway, the project was mostly prep work, and the first step was securing allies. Jim and Hannah had been decent to us, but that whole thing about possibly following orders to leave us to die was bad and needed fixing. To that end, both Jim and Hannah were invited down to our quarters, then locked in and treated to a class on ethics by our resident expert. What? Nubby. What? Don't laugh. This wasn't a class on those sissy, do unto others as you would have them do unto you ethics. This was a class on guardsman ethics, oh. which tend to only go as far as do unto others, and Nubby knew those by heart. He and Doc, as you might recall the friendliest and most persuasive members of our little group, were assisted by the ever-loyal Fumbles in teaching Camaraderie 101 to Jim and Hannah. The two junior tech priests were educated in why it is important to stick with your mates, when and when not to follow the rules and regs, mm -hmm. why you should never trust anyone over the rank of sergeant. <laughs> yeah. They also got a special bonus course on why killing your close personal friends because a crazy priest told you to is a very bad thing. Yes. By the end, both engine seers were thinking like proper guardsmen Good. and gave us all the vital information we needed for the rest of our project. Specifically, how the tech priests would probably monitor us, what sort of bomb they'd be giving us to plant, mm -hmm. and where it and its detonator were being built. Yay. From there, it was Twitch and Tink's show. Twitch was far. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick break just to get up, make yourself some popcorn, stuff like that, whatever it is you need to do. Um, I need to put a drop in my ear because this one's like lost. It is so. The guardsman ethics is just, that's an oxymoron at this point. It's complete oxymoron. Um, and yes, the Xenotech heresy, they are the Xenotech heresy at this point. Because there's too many Tau weapons, they're using a Tau drone, um, and they tried to hijack an Eldar shuttle after successfully hijacking a Necron shuttle. Uh, let's see, Aquila says, and then there's Cal who commits about 40 kinds of tech heresy by booting up his cogitators in the morning. <laughs> Alright guys, um, I will resume at about 158, so 158, 159. So, get up, stretch out, and then we'll get back to enjoying part six of the Xenotech Heresy. It, Marco Espinosa says, Guardsman Ethic, isn't that just Wait Wasteland Survival 101? Yes, and good Fallout reference.
and coming back. All right. All right. Let's see. And boom. So let's take a look. So let's see what everybody's been saying. All right. Um, especially bad thing. Never trust a priest like the emperor said when he burned down the Lighting Stone Church. Yes. Yes. He didn't have a high opinion of priests. Um, Bloody Magpie says, Excellent. The technological knowledge of tech priests and the understanding of reality as a veteran guardsman, a.k.a. the guardsman that survived the first three deployments. Yeah. That's never good. Um, thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Would you rather let your men loot Eldar or Tau weapons? How about orc weapons and Necron tech? Um, probably if I had a choice, Eldar, just because that stuff is nearly magical and it'd be good to get some, like, if the, if the Imperium could, rever like, reverse engineer anything that the Eldar have, it would be great uh tau would be more in line but at the same time the tau can afford to make they can afford to make battle suits because they just don't have enough coverage yet the wider they the, the the more expansive their empire becomes the less they're going to be able to do that unless your name is Jarek, don't use orc weapons this is very true hobbit Mr. Reich, can you even or loot orc weapons? Technically, you can. It's not a guarantee that they'll work. In fact, it's a very good probability they won't. Um, let's see. Bl Bloody Magpie says, making popcorn, modestly buttered. Hey, Glade Freeze, what's up, bud? Salted with, Aquila said, salts with the tears of those who generously donated to the chapter. All right, so... Yeah, orc weapons don't really work for humans, un like unless they're already practical. Like a power claw, claw is a very practical weapon. It relies on hydraulics. Yarik had to do some modif had to get some modifications done to the power claw that he got done uh, got put with because it wasn't exactly functional. Of course. Uh, let's see. Marco says, "Isn't the Inquisition hiding that the assassins use Necron and Jukari weapons?" It's kind of a thing where the assassins hide that well enough themselves. <sighs> Tired but alive. Yeah, that was me for a good portion of time. All right, X is in the chat to continue going with part six. And um, at the end of the stream, I'm going to see how you guys would feel about some game streams. And uh, I've got a couple of games in mind. I, I have... Uh, Let's see, I have the entire Resident Evil series, which uh, Slacker uh, Slacker actually provided that. Uh, zero, like the base game, zero through six. I also have something that I've been looking forward to play, but I never got a chance to. And it's a Mech Warrior, uh, 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 Mech, listen, Mech Commander, Mech Warrior, Mech Warrior 5 Mercenaries. And I haven't had a chance to play that yet. So, uh, Ronnie says refurbish X now, press refurbish button. <laughs> far too excited about his part of the plan. Mm -hmm. Not because he got to blow up people who annoyed him. Sarge had vetoed mining the priest's quarters on account of how we wanted to still have a ship after the mission. Yes. But because he got to play with the biggest bomb he'd ever seen. Nice. Now, when I say biggest, I don't mean its size. I mean its yield. The first time Twitch made his way through the vents to where the priests were putting the bomb together, he'd wound up needing a new pair of pants. They were giving us a backpack nuke. What? You're giving Twitch a backpack nuke? Hmm, Hobbit says game streams, yes. Um, yeah, thank you, Hobbit. I, I have been considering it for a bit. In fact, I haven't started any of the games because I've been sitting there going, you know, maybe I should do game streams with these. Um, will I consider the Mechanicus game? Yes. But I do, like, I, I have a lot of games right now that I haven't started playing. Twitch is in heaven. It's been said, mostly by guardsmen, that the final step of becoming a full tech priest involves having the common sense part of your brain pulled out and replaced with a little box of screws. 
In our opinion, the fact that they were giving us a nuclear weapon pretty much proved that. Yes, it does. Of course. They thought that they'd be the ones controlling it. No. They probably snickered to each other about how frustrated and scared we'd be. No. Not being able to set off the bomb after planting it, and not knowing if they'd remotely detonate it while we were in the blast radius. It's Twitch. Still, though, it was a titanically bad idea. Yes. I mean, even ignoring how much trouble we were able to cause with conventional explosives, we had a demolitions expert and what could loosely be called a technical expert in our squad. The second we were out of their line of sight, we were going to crack that puppy open and rewire the detonator. Yes, they are. So, Tink and Twitch spent their time spying on the bomb's construction and planning how they'd rewire it and jam the Cogboy's bugs. Meanwhile, the job of putting together a plan to screw over the Eldar fell to Amy and Doc. Largely because they were willing to do what the rest of the team was not. What's that? Sit through tedious lectures on xenopsychology from the adepts. Unfortunately, we didn't know exactly what the warlock was going to do. Only that dickishness would inevitably be involved. It's Eldar. This meant that Doc and Amy could only come up with sort of general plans. But they still did a very good job of it. A bunch of contingencies were prepared for, a few simple strategies were mapped out and practiced by our entire team, and Amy came up with a rather nasty strategy for forcing the warlock to behave if we ever saw him in person. Doc quietly told the rest of us that he was glad not to be the evil mastermind this time around, <laughs> and recommended we never antagonize the markswoman. When we finally came out of the warp at the border world, we felt ready for anything. Unfortunately, it turned out the other teams and adepts weren't nearly as awesome as us. Not uh, Slacker says, uh, thank you, Slacker. I got you 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. I don't think you'd like 5 and 6 on Revelations. They were made with co-op in mind. Um, well, somebody would have them. Somebody would have them. I I think. I, I honestly think. Um, yeah. Somebody would have them. Uh, thanks, Slacker. I appreciate it. And I, I got to tell you guys, like, um, I have been looking forward to that. I, I actually am the proud recipient of a 14-day full restriction from League of Legends. <laughs> because I ranged out like a motherfucker in that game. <sighs> Not only had they failed to pin down the location of the Archaeotech for us, they'd also been unable to confirm that it was even in the system. Sure, a quarter of them had died fighting on the station, and half the survivors were still being tended to by Doc and his girl, and they'd only been able to do their research via discreet astropathic questioning and a few out-of-date field reports. Still, though, we'd expected better of them. Mm. I mean, a little professionalism and work ethic isn't much to ask for, is it? It was going to be so damned embarrassing if it turned out the Eldar had been lying to us. We sat on the ship for a few days, twiddling our Thank thumbs you, and getting more and more worried while the other teams went down and made some discreet inquiries. Sergeant the Adepts helped them out, but the rest of us pretty much stayed in orbit and waited for the word go. Luckily, from our perspective, they met with enough resistance from the local government and Admech priesthood to practically prove the Archaeotech was there somewhere. Probably the only reason that no one tried to kill our investigators was the constant stream of ships pouring into the system at our request for reinforcements. Okay. Most of them were little navigatorless armed merchantmen. But there were a few escort class vessels, and the captains said our odds in a naval battle were definitely looking up. Still though, from what we overheard, the locals were some seriously uncooperative people. No one would admit to anything. Yay. Even when the interrogators started flashing their junior rosettes around. That changed abruptly when every astropath and navigator in the system reported a fleet approaching through the warp. This is always a good sign. 
While the incoming fleet was great for our investigation, it was also rather confusing. The only thing anyone knew for certain about how Necrons got their ships around was that they didn't use the warp. Yes, that's true. Of course, everyone said it was the Heretech fleet, but we knew better and spent a lot of time pondering what was actually coming. Honestly, it got very annoying telling everyone it wouldn't be a Heretech fleet, then not being able to say why. Sarge finally snapped during the final big meeting and just told everyone he'd made the fleet up to keep the tech priests in line. There was a lot of arguing and shouting after that, but luckily no mass servitor uprisings. <laughs> of course, about five minutes after he said that, a large group of what were unmistakably heretech vessels came out of the warp and demanded the surrender of all technology within the system. Nice. Everyone was, uh, too busy for much recrimination. But the captain did spare a few seconds to congratulate Sarge on being psychic. <laughs> Thanks, Aquila. Captain, congratulations, our chances of winning a naval battle have improved from 0% to 0.0001%. Progress. This is very true. Thank you, Aquila. With the arrival of the Heretech fleet, everything started happening at once. Sword Guy, who was still too injured to help much in combat, transferred over to the largest friendly vessel in system and started organizing the overall fleet. We'd been cobbling together. Armed with the intel provided by our ship's priests about the Heretech's probable armament and strategy, he was confident that he could keep the hostile fleet away from the planet for at least a day or two. Down on the planet, Battleaxe, who'd been leading the investigation, was approached by several local nobles who'd had a change of heart. Oh, really? The planet's nobles sold out their governor and put their forces at Battleaxe's command. Okay. The basic story they gave us was that the planetary governor had purchased the piece of Archaeotech and a team of scientists from a rogue trader. The device itself wasn't being used for anything, and they didn't actually know what it was but the technology being reverse engineered from it was supposed to turn their little SDF fleet into the most powerful space force this side of Battlefleet Ultima. Okay. They were patriots, see. It had all been for the work of their world, and by extension, the Imperium. Really? The governor had told them all within five years they'd be completely secure against any Tau aggression or Tyranid splinter fleets. Okay. In ten, their shipyards would be the envy of every forge world. Okay. In twenty, they'd personally control all space shipping from here to the Damocles Gulf. Okay. And by the end of the century, the Administratum would need to make a whole new sector just to contain the worlds they'd use their fleet to colonize and take back from the Tau. Mm -hmm. Quite the statement, but every tech priest and veteran voidsman they'd sent to look at the thing had confirmed it. This is apparently good shit. Uh, thank you, Slacker. Slacker says, hostile fleet, call for the White Scars, Dark Angels, or Black Templar. Dude, I'm going to call for the Black Templar every single time. I'm a fanboy. I, I can admit things about myself. I really, really can. Thank you, Slacker. Black Range Xenos, why are you looking funny, Horus? <laughs> so that all signed on. Even knowing that some Xenos force was chasing the Archaeotech and... Uh, Hobbit says while he's listening, he's gathering resources for base building in Fallout 4. I always liked it. I, I don't know if it's still there, but um, Sim Settlements. I always liked that would need to be fought off. They were confident in the size of their defense forces, they said. Mm -hmm. All those other worlds that had been wiped out were little undefended backwaters, they said. It was worth the gamble, they said. But now that they saw the size of the Heretech fleet, and the Inquisition was at their door, they were singing a different tune. Yeah. Up in our shuttle, we were listening to the whole spiel as we dropped towards the Manufactorum, they'd fingered. Everyone but Jim and Hannah, who were locked in the cockpit and keeping to themselves, speculated on just what sort of super weapon they'd found. If it really was such a big game changer, it'd be a shame to just blow it to little radioactive pieces. We were still going to do it, of course. Yeah, definitely. Aside from the whole thing where it was a heretical piece of Archaeotech with the potential to drive the Mechanicus to schism, 
You can't carry a nuke all the way down to a planet and not set it off. It's this just is... not allowed. I know. Anyway, as we went to go blow up the Archaeotech, Battleaxe was organizing a coup. She and her half-strength team would handle capturing the planetary governor and securing a temporary government with the help of most of the Nobs regiment. She wasn't hugging all the support troops, though. A sizable force had been stationed near the Manufactorum where the Archaeotech was located, and she sent them to lend us a hand. Well, actually, it was more a case of us lending them a hand. They had a lot less travel time than us, and we saw nothing wrong with them handling most of the grunt work. So our little eight-man force came down outside the Manufactorum after several hundred PDF yahoos had spent about an hour shooting the place all to hell. They may not have been quite as professional as leading some sort of high-precision strike force, but the important thing was that the place was clear and none of us had gotten shot in the process. That's always a good sign. A whole lot of PDF had, though. The place was a mess. That's what happens when you're dumb enough to try to rush fortified positions. Poor, dumb guard wannabes. Per our orders, the PDF had stayed out of the semi-secret basement where the Archaeotech was located. They had all just swept the upper building, which had been defended by a few of the governor's men and as well as a surprisingly large number of servitors. The servitors worried us at first, since the of heretics course. weren't supposed to be coming anywhere near close enough to shuttle or teleport a force down. Thankfully, when Jim and Anna came over to take a look, they said that the servitors didn't have any recognizable heretic markings. Good. That was a load off our minds, and we followed some PDF general over to the basement entrance. Surprisingly, Jim and Hannah both tagged along instead of returning to their shuttle. Sarge weighed the pros and cons of having two cogboys around when we went to blow up some piece of really cool tech, and decided to trust them. The engine seers fell in behind Twitch, who was lugging a rather heavy backpack containing a large metal cylinder with an unnecessary amount of ornamentation on its surface. The bomb did not have any exterior controls, readouts, or anything aside from what Jim told us were etchings of holy scenes and prayers written in binary. Oh god. It looked like a drum for storing holy water more than anything. Yeah. It was about the right size and weight. We'd had to scrounge a grav plate and clamp it to the bottom for anyone but Sarge to be able to carry the thing. Hmm. Presumably, the whole reason for the bomb's odd design was that there were no exposed controls for us to muck around with and no way to see inside. It should have stopped anyone who wasn't entirely suicidal from trying to go in and rewire its detonator. Tank and Twitch are entirely suicidal. But Twitch had the thing cut open within 10 minutes of Go our shuttle's you. departure. Now, the nuke's top was held on with duct tape. <laughs> its remote control was hooked up to a novelty noisemaker, and the only way to set it off was using the detonator Sarge was carrying. After a rather unpleasant walk through the corpse-filled building, we reached the entrance to the underground lab where the Archaeotech was stored. We stood around the intimidating entrance for a while, wondering just what sort of defenses were waiting down there. And if it would do any harm to send a few squads of PDF down first. Our little debate was interrupted by a call from the captain, who warned us that the fleet engagement had started, and okay. that, inexplicably, all astropathic communications were being blocked. Nice. Jim blanched at hearing that second part, and told us that the heretics didn't have a way to do that. Uh-huh. The Necrons were here. Yes, they are. Confirmation arrived in the form of a few dozen green lightning storms outside the window. They were Aquila says, ah, duct tape. Probably the only thing more holy than prayers and binary. Yes, if you cannot duck it, fuck it. ...weren't violent enough to be an orbital bombardment and faded quickly. But they left behind some very ominous glowing clouds. Mm -hmm. Tink went over to a window and ratcheted up the zoom on his goggles then went pale and recommended that we go blow up the Archaeotech right now. <laughs> there wasn't time to fool around with sending scouts down there, 
And anyway, the PDF would need all the men they had to fight off the millions of metal insects that had just teleported into the atmosphere. Yay! We didn't need telling twice and practically sprinted into the basement, only stopping to advise the PDF general to conserve ammo and save his last round for himself. Twitch and Fumbles went first to check for traps and ambushes. Sarge tried to take the nuke from Twitch before he Thank took you, point, Paula. but the demolitions trooper flatly refused. He claimed the bomb was his now. Uh, Hobbit says, that, mo that motto sounds a bit slaneshy. No, that, that motto is actually Mechanicus in nature. Um, it is very Mechanicus in nature. M3, I think the origin of that was. M2? No, M2. If you can't duck it, fuck it. Thanks. Thanks, Hobbit. Uh, Slacker says, Twitch is pretty scaven like every explosive set has a 99% chance of going off. That's actually quite true. <laughs> Thank you, Slacker. It's actually quite true. That is remarkably true. Twitch is just my spirit animal in this series. And he'd be damned if anyone would take it from him. Anyway, he said it wasn't getting in his way and Thank it you, actually helped him concentrate. Just carrying it made him feel all warm and fuzzy inside, he said. Yeah, of course. The rest of us thought that sounded like it was leaking radiation, but didn't Probably push the is. issue. Aside from a few traps which Twitch easily disarmed, the stairs down there weren't defended by anyone. Either they'd all fought and died on the surface, or they'd fallen back to the big room at the bottom of the stairs. We all bet on the ladder and formed up to breach the final door. The charges went off, flashes were tossed, and we all rushed in with weapons raised. Mm -hmm. Then we all sheepishly walked down the empty hallway to what was actually the final door ah, and okay. did it all again. There you go. This time, a hail of laser fire poured out at us as we scrambled to find cover in a very large room. Luckily, in addition to being very large, the room was littered with all sorts of conduits, machinery, and inexplicably chest-high walls. Everybody name the bomb. Give your best name for the bomb. Through a combination of luck and skill, we all managed to find something solid to hide behind, and started trading fire with what looked to be five tech priests. Originally, we'd had some vague plan that Tink would find where in the room the Archaeotech was, and Twitch would plant the bomb while the rest of us held off the defenders. But that didn't turn out to be necessary. For one thing, it was easy to see where the Archaeotech was. A massive, opaque shield took up the rear half of the room. Mm -hmm. For another, the tech priests didn't need to be held off. They were pathetic. These guys weren't anything like the sort of mechanical combat monstrosities we'd expected. They were just relatively normal tech priests with laser pistols. They hold up behind some ineffective cover and we just picked them off one by one while Jim and Hannah made a half-hearted attempt to negotiate their surrender. There was just one of the tech priests left and we were arguing over whether to try and take him alive so he could deactivate the shield. Mm-hmm. Then we all heard a metal stomping sound and something that looked like a cross between a dreadnought, a necron, and a metal squid came around the edge of the shield. No. That description doesn't really do the metal monstrosity justice. No. Start by imagining a dreadnought made of that weird metal that the Tau use for everything. You know, the tan stuff. Now, replace its arms with a pair of those green tube Necron weapons. The kind that shoot lightning that evaporates whatever it hits. Finally, imagine that instead of it having an armored front plate protecting a dead hero of the Imperium, it has this writhing ball of mechadendrites, and somewhere in the middle is a crazy- Okay, I've watched enough anime to know where this is going. Tech priests screaming in binary. We were so incredibly screwed, it was almost funny. <laughs> We'd Okay, so let's see some of the names you got. Alright, here we go. Mary Ann, Twitch Jr., Nora, with Imps from Love, The Courier, Roger, Twitch Jr., Gift for Oak, C Courier, Sancta Maria, the bomb's name is Oshi. <laughs> Oshi! 
I like that. Little Boy, Kilroy, Miss, Mrs. Twitch, Big Bertha, The Inquisitorial Complaint, The Emperor's Middle Finger, Skitters, Orc Eater, as per my last email, a Necron's worst friend. Um, a Necron's warm friend. Okay. Hold on a second. We're going to pull this one. All right. So my favorites out of this are, let's see, Oshi from Ronnie. Oshi. And... The Inquisitorial Complaint from Aquila. Hold on. And I misspelled the ever-living hell out of that. There we go. Alright, so... Let's... Go. Name the nuke. Been expecting something worse than a few schmucks with laser pistols. But for once, our cynicism and paranoia had been insufficient. We all just stared for a second as the thing stomped towards us. Almost absent-mindedly, Amy headshot the last wimpy tech priest. <laughs> then the green tube started charging up and Sarge screamed at everyone to pop smoke and scatter. Yes. Cover wasn't going to do shit against those Necron beams. No. As the room filled with smoke, the beams started lancing out and leaving big empty gouges in the floor. Uh-huh. Operating pretty much independently, everyone started readying what anti-armor equipment they had. Sarge started the show by peeking through the edge of the smoke, noticing he was behind the dreadnought and activating the special rangefinder dealie on his totally not a tau pulse carbine. <laughs> to everyone but Tink's surprise, it worked perfectly. He and Amy suddenly had the location of the dreadnought displayed on their goggles and scope respectively. Two balls of plasma, one big and fat, the other small and fast, flew out of the smoke. They both hit the dreadnought and the mass of mechadendrites that passed for a torso, but only managed to burn a few of the tentacles off. The dreadnought aimed down the gaps in the smoke the shots had left and returned fire. Tink was away before his shot even hit, but Amy wasn't as quick and her world went green. None of us were in position to see what happened, but Amy screamed like a stuck grox and flooded the comms channel with an incredible scream of curses. She's alive. We okay. took that as a sign that she'd live yeah. and concentrated on the fight. She'll live. Not having fancy targeting toys, Nubby and Tink had to find gaps in the smoke to make their attacks through. Nubby hung back and put some well-aimed last shots into the dreadnought, causing it to stomp towards him while Twitch darted forward with a deck pack. Twitch! Sarge groaned when he saw Twitch sprint out of the smoke with the nuke still strapped to his back, then nearly had a heart attack when one of the Dreadnought's weapons swiveled towards the demolitions trooper. Thinking quickly, he activated his auxiliary grenade launcher and fired a Tau flash grenade between Twitch and the Dreadnought. The Dreadnought's beam missed Twitch's nuclear backpack by centimeters. Lovely. And the blinded trooper slammed helmet first into one of its legs. Now stunned as well as blind, Twitch staggered around for a second, then suddenly disappeared as Fumbles stuck his head out of the smoke. The dreadnought stomped around for a second trying to find Twitch, then gave up and returned to chasing Nubby as another hail of laser shots hit it. Sarge confirmed that Twitch was still alive, then ran off into the smoke to emulate Nubby's hit and run harassment. While everyone else was running and shooting, Tink sat still and waited for his plasma gun to recharge. As he waited, he noted Sarge wasn't marking the target anymore and sent Spot out to keep an eye on things. Thanks to the drone's vid feed, he was the first of us to oh, this xenotech heresy. notice that the dreadnought was slowing down a little. Initially, he put it down to some sort of battle damage but then he spotted the familiar-looking skulls flying above the smoke. As he watched, one of them darted down and attached itself to two others on the dreadnought's back, okay. causing it to slow down a little more. Jim and Hannah's skulls saved all of our lives as we pulled ourselves back together. None of us were sure what exactly they were doing, and the engine seers seemed too busy to explain, but the dreadnought got slower and more inaccurate with each passing second. Everyone stayed back and peppered it with lays and plasma, 
forcing it to constantly stomp around hunting for us. It was looking like we'd be able to wear the thing down, especially since Amy had got back into the fight, then the tech priest caught on. He let out an incredibly pissed sounding scream and his mechadendrites started ripping the skull off of his back. He'd caught on to our only real trick, but he was distracted. It was time to do or die. Twitch shared some debt packs with Sarge, Fumbles cloaked them both and they ran in. It probably would have worked, but it wound up not having to. When the sprinters were halfway to the dreadnought, its mechadendrites started bursting apart with little flashes of light. A few seconds later, the flashes were followed by a very familiar lance cannon beam and one of those hell orbs. It's the Eldar. Finally, a blast of raw psychic energy came out of the smoke and slammed right into the middle of the dreadnought's tentacle face. That was apparently the thing's limit. It let out a sound like blender with a rock in it, <laughs> powered down and toppled backwards. The warlock swept out of the smoke with dun, 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 Slacker says, Servo skulls are oddly adorable. I will fight over this issue. <laughs> you won't get me fighting with you. I like servo skulls. I just have a problem with cherubs, flying babies. I have a problem with this. I have an extensive problem with this. The uh, poll is done. The name of the nuke is the Inquisitorial Complaint. Uh, Squibble. Squibble says he caught his first stream. Is the renowned prophet among us? No, he is not. Um, I don't. Th he. I don't think he's able to make the weekend streams. Uh, thank you, Slacker. I appreciate it. Uh, Hobbit says blender in a with a rocket. That hurts to think about. Yeah, it does. I. Ronnie is correct on his uh, statement right there. I don't hate the Tau Tech. I hate the Tau. Um, I really don't like the Tau two of his wraith guards in tow. The one with the weird hell gun set about methodically sucking pieces Please let them please let the spiffing Brit refurbished warlock be here. ...as of the dreadnought into the warp, while the other didn't quite aim its laser cannon at us. The warlock walked up to Sarge, congratulated him on holding out for so long, then apologized for not arriving sooner. Mm -hmm. He'd had more important matters to take care of. Probably Sarge didn't shit. deck the smug bastard, but it was a near thing. Given that the warlock was there in person, and had a pair of wraith guards with him, we were much more polite this time. Sarge made an attempt at diplomatic small talk while the rest of us formed up and took stock. Mostly we were just bruised, exhausted, and low on ammo. Amy was the only one of us who'd taken an actual hit. When Jim and Hannah helped her through the smoke, the conversation stopped for a second as everyone stared. Her hair and helmet had been given what you might call a reverse mohawk. The Necron beam had been a millimeter from taking the top of her head off. Everyone quickly found something else to look at, especially the other figures coming through the smoke. Ooh, that's bad. The Warlock's Rangers were practically dragging two short figures. One we all recognized as a Tau Earthcast, but the other looked like a monkey that someone had been testing Augmetics on. Nick says, I will support you on this issue, but look at this cute little Ogren skull. It's cute and derpy, and like a pagan's, just as precious. What? I don't... Ogren skulls? No. it. I don't want to look at an Ogren skull. Human skulls are fine, Nick. Thank you, but... Uh, no! What? Like a pug's just as precious? Oh. What? I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out, because like... Yeah, Ogren skull... You no. Know. Okay, here we go. They're bringing in a towel, Earthcast. I'm guessing it's Tink's little girlfriend. The 
Tao was frantic, and when he saw us, he started babbling at us in Gothic. Uh-huh. He'd been kidnapped, which was illegal. Who cares? Then enslaved, which was doubly illegal. Who cares? Then forced to work with all sorts of mentally unstable people. And That's now he difficult. was kidnapped again, and he just wanted to go home. Nobody cares. Sarge digested this for a second, then shot a confused look at the warlock. Mm-hmm. He said that the Tau was the last of the Archaeotech science team, and ordered him to deactivate the shield. Okay. We all followed the Tau scientist to a cogitator station, listening to a steady list of complaints on the way. The monkey remained silent, but tried to bite the ranger holding it a few times. Chikara. Once at the station, the Tau pressed a few buttons and asked Sarge to flip a heavy-looking lever. The shield vanished with a loud crack and revealed the Archaeotech that had caused all this trouble. Jim and Tana fell to their knees in awe while everyone else stared. Then Nubby swore loudly, Twitch started laughing, and Sarge facepalmed. Tink peeked out from the back of the group and turned to Amy. Huh. Looks like a Necron ship. I knew it! I fucking knew it! It's the Necron ship! I've been saying this for like five episodes! Wonder how the hell they got that. <laughs> we checked, just to be sure. I fucking knew it! There was a slim possibility that someone else had gotten their hands on a damaged Necron vessel. It didn't have to be the one that we gave to a rogue trader it in exchange was. for some fire support. Good job. The whole entire bloody mess, from the empty worlds to the damned Heretech fleet above us, didn't have to be the result of us they cutting are. a quick deal to save our skins. This didn't have to be our fault. It is. It was, of course. It is. We could see the spot where we'd melted our way in, and the words... Nubby was here, glaring <laughs> damningly at us from the inside of the ship's open door. Oh, I love it. This was probably going to go down in some inquisitorial history book as it the is. most colossal screw-up ever performed by a bunch of low-level grunts. I mean, cults and traitors typically have to work for years to achieve this sort of mess. We managed to achieve it in just a few minutes of panicked bargaining. Oak, or maybe even the Lord Inquisitor himself, I love it. was going to nail our ears to the wall and peel yes. our skin off with a dull spoon over this. Yes. Assuming we survived the current mess, that is. Amy, Tink, and the rest of the team caught on to what was going on in a few seconds. They'd heard that story more than a few times. The Eldar didn't get it, though, and just stared at us as we all alternated between swears, moans, and hysterical laughter. Eventually, the Warlock got frustrated trying to piece things together and demanded an explanation from Sarge. Our fearless leader was obviously not thinking clearly, because in a fit of retardation, he told the Xenos the truth. Oh my god. Oh boy, was he pissed. Oh, really? The lecture we got was a nice preview of the one we'd inevitably get when uh -huh. we made our end of mission report. The word incompetent was used at least 30 times. Yeah. And it was amazing how many synonyms for idiot the warlock could think up. Yep. It was quite embarrassing, but the sheer grating annoyance of being lectured by the smug Xenos bastard eventually brought us back to reality. The lecture ended with a wail of... Do you know how much time and life you've wasted with your own stupidity? Which Sarge sourly counted with, oh, Shut up. We're guardsmen. Wasting time and life is practically our job description. It, just a question. Just a real question. Is an Eldar... Is an Eldar having the balls... Having the absolute balls to tell someone else that they have wasted time and lives with their stupidity. The balls on this guy. The absolute balls. While the warlocks are... 
Okay, guys. Um, one thing. I have pugs. I love my pugs. I'm leaving it at that. I would appreciate no further conversation. I understand if you disagree. Uh, I understand if you don't like them. But I'd appreciate it if it would stop. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you, Aquila. To be fair, usually the Eldar do not waste time and life on accident. Not anymore, at least. Oh, they only did it for 60 million years. I mean, that's the only thing they really did with it. Um... I mean, seriously, it's the only thing they did with it. They just wasted it. ...for more words to express his outrage, Sarge ordered the rest of us to secure the ship and asked the warlock what his plan for sorting all this out was. Sarge and the Eldar argued over whether the Heretex and Necrons would leave the system if we just blew up the ship. Blow up the ship. While they did, the rest of us took the Tau prisoner and inspected the ship. Thank you, Aquila. It had changed a lot since we'd last seen it. The place was practically filled with things that looked like a hybrid of Tau and Imperial tech. Jim and Hannah snapped out of the religious days they'd been in and, after a bit of outrage about how heretical everything was, started asking the terrifying scientist questions. Playing tour guide seemed to calm the Tau down immensely. He led the tech priests around the ship with Tink tagging along and asking annoying questions. They were given a completely incomprehensible summary of how the scientist had merged Tau, Imperial, and Jokero tech into something that could interface with Necron systems. Supposedly, that let them reverse engineer pieces of the tech and make their own versions or something. It was pretty much impossible to follow. While the nerds babbled about how this was the greatest scientific advancement in centuries, Twitch and Nubby went to find a place to plant the nuke and blow it all up. Good. Uh, thank you, Slacker. Eldar hypocrites, pugs are adorable. I won't want to own one, though. Same with cats. I had three of them growing up and never again want one. I actually, the, there's one dog breed, uh, there's one dog that I really love, and, and, and that is um, a husky, but I wouldn't want one because uh, just, like, my brother really liked them, um, but I wouldn't want one because I have a thing about large dogs, um, and when I was a kid I got cornered by a boxer with the most irresponsible owner in the world who thought it was funny seeing a seven-year-old kid be absolutely terrified of a St. Bernard mixed with a boxer. Um, so I've had a problem with large dogs, larger dogs ever since then. I love them. I think they're beautiful. But if you put one around me, I start getting antsy. I mean, it's just the way it is. I mean, childhood trauma was great. Um, yeah, it is what it is. But I completely understand somebody doesn't want certain kinds of dogs. It is what it is. Um, TJS says, we have a small to medium dog. I mean, 21 pound cat. 21 pound cat? Holy God. Are you sure this isn't a lion? I'm just asking. <laughs> There's probably something deep and philosophical you could say about that. But we were guardsmen. We had a really big bomb. And damned if we weren't going to use it. Let's go. Twitch slid the actual Thank go you, boom part of the bomb out of its decorative cylinder and crammed it into an out of the way crevice. He was literally vibrating with excitement as he taped the thing into place and armed it. Outside, Amy and Fumbles watched Sarge's back as he brainstormed with the Eldar, and over the secure comm, Tink and Jim had rigged the Adepts. It was a rather tense situation, especially when the senior tech priests started repeatedly trying to call Sarge's main comm. Luckily, everything stayed subcritical, and a plan was formed. The ship had to be destroyed, of course, as did the facility and any notes. The problem was that neither the Necrons nor the Heretics were likely to leave the system until they'd checked the planet over themselves. 
Since that checking would doubtlessly involve the death by Scarab Swarm or demonic machine of everyone on the planet, that wasn't an ideal solution. Twitch is gonna For a while, they toyed with the this. idea of taking the ship, which the scientists had gotten flying again and running. The theory was that the Necrons and Heretex would follow it and leave the planet alone, but the Eldar pointed out that the vessel wasn't warp capable and the Necrons would catch anything that was. Mm -hmm. Really, the only way to save the planet was to somehow stall the attackers until reinforcements arrived, or get them in a fight with each other. To this end, Sarge suggested just giving the ship to the Heretex with the experimental Tau tech on it mined, but the nuke left out. No, give them the this nuke This was too. vetoed by the Warlock as well as Jim and Hannah. Finally, after a little debate, an even more suicidal plan was agreed on. The ship would be flown between the Heretech fleet and the region of space where the Eldar said the Necrons were hiding. Okay. When both fleets closed on the prize, the ship's teleportation jammers would be dropped and the Necrons would be forced to kill all the Heretechs in case they ported something off the ship. If, somehow, the That's... Heretechs looked like they'd win, the nuke would be detonated. The only questions left were who would detonate the nuke, who would crew the ship, and what would happen to the crew when the teleportation jammer went down. The Warlock promised that if we crewed the ship with the Tau Scientist, his vessel would follow us at maximum teleportation range. The jammer would go down, we'd arm the mines, and then we'd port out and he'd carry us to safety on Bullshit. the only ship in the system fast and stealthy enough to survive the ensuing melee. Bullshit. For trust reasons, the nuke's detonator would be left in our hands, but also put on a timer in case something went wrong. Bullshit. Sarge eventually agreed. Why? Everyone sprang into action. Did you not remember the constant conversations about being dicked over by the, by the Eldar? The nerdier members of the team went back aboard with the Tau scientist to prep the ship for its last flight. The warlock ordered his men to rig their own charges in the lab. Then, the second the Tau scientist was out of sight, and without the slightest hesitation, decapitated the captive augmetic monkey. Amy put in a courtesy call to the PDF upstairs, who were surprisingly still alive, telling them to bug out if they could. Finally, Sarge called the captain and other interrogators to fill them in on the plan. The tech priests must have been listening in too, because the little noisemaker we had their remote nuke detonator hooked up to went off halfway through the conversation. Sarge called the cogboys assholes and promised everyone else it would work out. <laughs> he then got a final sit rep from the rest of us and walked over to where the Eldar was cleaning his sword. Sarge gave the Xenos his best parade ground salute, later, then Blade. thanked him for agreeing to teleport us out of the ship. The burly non-com held out his hand, and after an awkward pause, the warlock sheathed his sword and took it, looking Sarge right in the eyes and saying it was the least he could do. The Xenos shook his hand. Inside that stupid helmet, he was probably grinning ear to ear yes, about how was. clever he was, and how the annoying guardsmen would finally be getting what they had coming. Exactly. Imagine how the Xenos bastard's expression must have changed when Sarge's grip tightened and dragged him forward. The final stage of Operation Screw Everyone Else Over Before They Screw Us was beautiful. Yes? Sarge and the Warlock both staggered backwards as Nubby darted forwards, and Tink pulled the lever. Before any of the other Xenos could do a thing... The ship's shield sprang back up and cut them off from their leader. The warlock's sword hand was locked in Sarge's grip, but his eyes started glowing and sparks appeared around his offhand. This was interrupted by a sticky sounding thunk as Nubby slapped a debt pack onto his chest. That <laughs> shiny looking gem that sat in the middle of his armor. The Xenos went stock still. <laughs> Hypnotized by either the blinking light on the charge, or the way Nubby was waving a dead man's detonator over his head and cackling. <laughs> Sarge released the warlock's hand, stepped backwards, and 
formally welcomed him to the ship's crew. Yay! He managed to get through the whole speech without cracking a smile. But behind him, Amy and Nubby were grinning wide enough to swallow an entire sewer's worth of shit. <laughs> he wrapped the speech up with a little warning about what would happen if anything cut the comm connection to the pack's detonator. Uh -oh. Then advised the Xenos to come aboard and start arranging our exit strategy. The Eldar glared at everyone for a while, then stalked into the ship while swearing and promising vengeance under his breath. <laughs> Sarge clapped him on the back with a hearty, that's the spirit, son. <laughs> I love Twitch! Oh my... <laughs> and followed him in. Yes! So no shit, there we were. No shit, there we were. On a Necron ship, mm -hmm. being piloted by a terrified Tau scientist. Yes. Flying out to start a fight between a Heretech fleet and a mm -hmm. Necron extermination force. Let's go. And our only chance of survival resting on an Eldar warlock, who we'd taken hostage by gluing a debt pack to his spirit gem. <laughs> Gotta say this for life in the Inquisition. It may be absolute. <laughs> Reject modernity. Embrace monkey. Absolutely insane, but it makes for some great stories. I, I, like, seriously, this is, this is the best. This is the absolute best. I love this timeline. Our flight up to orbit was less interesting than you'd think. We didn't have any windows to see the massive swarm of Necron scarabs we were flying through. Yay. Mostly, we ran around, placing all of- Slacker says, told you you'd love what happens with a dead pack. I did? I still do? Fuck that Eldar. Thank you, Slacker. Twitch's debt packs and helping the Tau keep all the jury-rigged systems running. The little guy was terrified to the point of gibbering by the situation, and Fumbles was put on duty behind him, pumping a constant stream of positive mental energy or whatever. Sarge took the detonator from Nubby and hung out with Amy and the warlock and ironed out the last little pieces of the plan. Like when the Imperial fleet would disengage, and how the teleporting would actually work. The Eldar seemed to have accepted that all he had to do to get out of the situation in one piece was not be a dick. <laughs> this was probably very hard for him. I know, Dickishness right? Dickishness being the nature of Eldar and all. Yes. But aside from being a little surly, he was coping. In fact, spirits were high all around after Fumbles calmed the Tau down. The only people who seemed to be unsure about the plan were Jim, Hannah, and Tink. The techies were all rather torn by the way we were about to destroy a technomagical marvel, and the fact that the Eldar flatly refused to allow the Tau to live. The warlock held that the fact that we felt sorry for him was immaterial. I would. He would have to stay and keep flying evasively while we poured it out. A mine would be placed on his seat to ensure he didn't fall into enemy hands. Okay. Sarge pointedly ignored the mutinous looks and whispering the statement generated. It took an amazingly short amount of time to reach the edge of the fleet engagement. Uh, Nick Fulton says, now to keep him at the end and have a pet Xenos. No, no, like, you wouldn't want to, I just say, you wouldn't want a warlock as a pet. They tend to make bad pets. Thanks, Nick, I appreciate it, bud. Necron ships are ludicrously fast. Yes, they are. As we edged around the Imperial fleet, some final preparations were made. There was going to be a brief period of time between when the ship's teleporter jammer went down and when the Eldar vessel would be able to get us out of there. Because science or something. That meant we'd have to ford up together on the fancy pad thingy, and hold off whatever ported in, then activate the mines and nukes timer right as we ported out. So barricades were constructed and lines of fire were cleared, while Sarge went over the ship's big Vox station and opened up the general channel. Sarge loudly, jovially even, announced that the Archaeotech was right here, and the Heretechs could bloody well have it if they could catch him. He panned the vid feed around a little, then to really sell things, 
walked over to the Tau scientist and asked him to say hi to the crazy metal men. Mm-hmm. Both groups of them. <laughs> the Tau let out a sort of high-pitched wheezing sound and tried to slap the recorder away. Sarge laughed and reminded everyone that this was the last surviving scientist that had been studying the ship. Nice. This was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, folks. Then he cut the feed, but left the transmitter on so everyone could find us. We were all watching on the ship's holo thing, and it was surreal Holothing. how the Heretech fleet shifted. Every single vessel turned as one, <laughs> ignoring the Imperial ships and burning towards us at maximum speed. Simultaneously, a section of empty space on our opposite side filled with little moon-shaped ships and a larger one that looked like sort of a fork. Oof. They were farther away, but started closing the gap with incredible speed. I don't think the heretics All of us who'd been here. laughing at Sarge's little speech went silent yes. and watched as they closed on us like two sets of teeth. Keeping the balance between the two incoming fleets was tricky, but the Tau scientist and his assistants managed it. As they closed, it got harder and harder to dodge incoming fire, and the shield started soaking shots and we all watched the timer until both the heretics were in teleportation range carefully. Everyone had their own little nervous reactions as the enemy closed, ranging from Amy repeatedly checking her weapon to mm -hmm. Jim and Hannah praying. <laughs> Sarge took special note of the way Tink was hugging his drone like a teddy bear, oh my God. and how Twitch kept fiddling with the empty nuke case which he had been keeping for sentimental reasons. The warlocks signaled it was time to fall back to the teleporter and personally placed the mine on the back of the Tau's seat. As he did it, he leaned in and told the poor sucker to be careful to stay in his seat so the Eldar ship's teleporter could lock onto him. Oh, God. Seriously. What a Eldar dick. dicks. Yeah, dicks. Everyone slowly filed out after the Eldar to where the... Uh, but it's happening to a Tau... You know, even I gotta say, you know, that's a little bit too dickish. Just kill him. The actual teleportation would be happening. Tink, Twitch, and Fumbles brought up the rear. The techie was crying, and Fumbles was radiating waves of misery as well. I think Hannah would shoot Tink. Sarge running. carefully ignored them, but the warlock spared a second to tell them that they were pathetic, and to ask Fumbles to control his aura. It was making it hard for him to focus his own powers. Fumbles flipped him off. Ha! <laughs> When the timer hit zero, Twitch activated his time detonators and Jim did something. The entire ship immediately filled with crackling electricity and a wave of pressure that nearly deafened us. Mm. What poured it in was horrific. The dreadnought thing we'd fought down in the lab had nothing on these guys. They were like the Skitari that accompany the Titan Legions crossed with demons. There was metal and flesh, and guns, and claws, yeah. and way more tentacles than anyone should ever have to see in one place. Yeah, that's a lot of anime. We all froze for a second, then before we could fire, the second wave arrived. The Necrons' teleporters seemed a little smoother than the Heretics. There wasn't any lightning or pressure, just a flash of green light. Then the ship was completely packed with metal skeletons. Oh, yeah. Giant, clawed metal worm things, and a few thousand scarabs. Yeah. We all heard a tinny screaming from the Tau. Then the explosives started going off. Yay! Uh, thank you, Slacker. Necrons obviously weren't from Trazen. If he had gotten the ship before anyone knew where it was and captured everyone that saw it. Yeah, he would have done that. He would have gotten the ship before anyone else knew where it was. Um, Trazen is a dick. How come all the named characters in Xeno races and, like, human for that matter, are just complete dicks? Um, Arnook says, Do you think that Twitch will try to make a new nuke with a case? Are you, are you, are you shitting me? He, he of course he's going to. That's just, that's the thing. Uh, Aquila says, The favorite party game of any Dark Abbot is how many demons can we fit into this machine? <laughs> this is true. Um, thank you, Slacker. And yes, the Necrons are definitely not from Trazen, but what... 
Because they've been tracking this thing. What if they're part of the Chronomancer? Just, just saying. Everywhere except for our little three meter pad exploded into violence. Yay! There aren't words to properly describe what we saw around us in that ship as we waited for the teleporter to activate. We held our fire and just stared into the maelstrom around us, trying to pick out what was an actual threat and what wasn't. At first, it looked like everything was just going to ignore us. We mm -hmm. were too minor to pay any attention to. Then a single skeleton, taller and fancier looking than the others, stepped right through our barricades and raised a glowing green staff over its head. Yay! Three laser guns, three plasma weapons, two psychic attacks, and a pair of servo skulls slammed into its face. <laughs> the boss cron rocked back and a literal wave of scarabs rushed over him, absorbing our follow-up barrages. Its staff swept downwards and was just barely deflected by the warlock's fancy sword. The Eldar managed to deflect two more surprisingly fast blows from the Necron's power staff, while the rest of us poured as much fire as we could into it. Mm -hmm. Then the world went white and everything around the edge of the platform disappeared. They teleported. That had been the first teleportation any of us were a part of. Uh -huh. And honestly, it wasn't nearly as bad as everyone made it out to be. There was no muss, no fuss, and no screaming demonic voices accompanied by lightning bolts. Yay! Just one second here, next second there. That was probably because it was a Xenos teleporter, though. Anyway, the first thing we noticed upon arrival was that the Maelstrom of Violence had been replaced by an equally unsettling army of Eldar. Yeah, that, that, that's the good. The Bosscron looked around for a second, obviously didn't like the odds, then vanished in another flash of green, oh, leaving behind go. a few dozen scarabs. We very carefully shot these, making sure not to raise our weapons high enough to threaten any of our very nice new hosts. No, they're not nice. The warlock breathed a sigh of relief and barked some orders in pointy ear speak. He then turned back and asked us to hand over the detonator and remain on the pad until we reached teleportation range of an Imperial vessel. Sarge kept his grip on the detonator and suggested that our arrival had damaged the teleporter. Possibly in such a way that it would port us all into the void instead of the vessel. Uh huh. All in all, he'd prefer to hand the detonator over after a shuttle ride to the occurrence border. Uh huh. Sarge the Eldar ain't muttered stupid. something that sounded like lucky guess, waved <laughs> the soldiers away, and started leading us through the fancy but confusing corridors of his ship. We rode back on a Slacker asks, how does Eldar teleportation compare to Dark Age of Technology teleportation? It's kind of hard to say. We've seen a couple of, of examples of Dark Age of Technology teleportation, and it seems to be equal to it. But once you get to a certain level, they kind of perfected the technology. So I'm guessing that they would be very, very similar. So probably equal to, or just a little bit less because... Eldar have been working on it for a very, very long time. There are about two examples in the lore that I know of of Dark Age of Technology tele teleportation tech. In any case, thank you, Slacker. A very familiar looking shuttle, and spent the majority of the voyage trying to stare down the wraith guards and rangers we ditched in the lab. <laughs> Thankfully, Sarge was able to keep things to a low simmer keeping Nubby from saying anything at all, and covering for Tink and Fumbles, who were in some sort of depressive feedback loop. There was a scary moment when we got back into comm range of the occurrence border. Jim and Hannah both seized up and started twitching, causing Tink to break out of his funk and grab his tools. He couldn't quite call what followed combat surgery, but it was close. Tink ripped out something small and metal out of Jim's neck, and then they both went to work on Hannah and extracted something similar. When Sarge asked what the hell had happened, Tink said the senior tech priests were rather angry and left it at that. After that little show, Sarge what? put in a call to our adepts and filled them in on our imminent arrival. Oh my god. The bay we touched down in was some sort of racially insensitive standoff, <laughs> with the ship's senior tech priests and their servitors, staring down the captain and a small army of his armsmen. 
The warlock took a look around, laughed, and told us to have fun. Sarge flipped him off and handed over the detonator, prompting the warlock to laugh some more. After the guests had left, our little family squabble really got rolling. Yay! The tech priests were livid and wanted us dead, and the captain was equally furious that anyone dared to question his authority on, on his, his ship. ship. The only thing that kept it from exploding into a bloodbath was the arrival of a sensor tech, reporting that the nuke had gone off and taken a small heretech cruiser out along with the ship. Twitch Yay. giggled at that. That wasn't the end of the good news. Apparently, the heretechs had decided that they'd settle for an unmodified Necron ship and were going at the Necron fleet hammer and tongs. Okay. From the look of it, it'd be days before either side had attention to spare for us. Good. The captain called that as near a total victory as was possible. Then yes. browbeat the tech priest about how the archaeotech hadn't fallen into heretical hands and there'd be time to wait for Juris. None of us knew who Juris was, but Jim said it was a good thing that we accepted being confined to quarters until he arrived. The first thing we noticed after being escorted to our quarters was the large amount of dead servitors. Then the fairly severe structural damage to the hallway. Finally, the note from old Bill saying that we were going to have to clean and repair it ourselves. Huh. No one in the engineering department was willing to even walk down this corridor much less touch anything. They'd even cut a new entry point to the Gellerfield generator from a side corridor. Twitch surveyed the carnage with pride, especially the part where the doors to our quarters were still sealed despite the damage. <laughs> well, Twitch kept everybody out of their quarters. Yeah. He supervised the careful opening of one of the doors, while our senior tech priest and servitor escort stayed at the end of the hallway and glared at everyone. Once it was open, we all piled in. Fumbles in the engine's ears included, then sealed the door behind us. After a quick sweep to check- <laughs> Yeah, Slacker, Twitch. Thanks, Slacker. Twitch- if you're wondering why the, there's a whole bunch of dead servitors and the place looks like it's been through a war, Twitch forgot to disable his mines and his traps and claymores and everything else that he puts up when, you know, he's securing the perimeter. Twitch literally is my spirit animal. Here we go. Thank you, Slacker. Check it for any bugs. The techies confirmed the room was clean and Twitch dropped the nuke case he'd still been carrying. To Sarge's complete lack of surprise, when the lid was popped off, a nearly asphyxiated Tau scientist plopped onto the floor, followed by Tink's drone controller. You say After the little guy had a minute to breathe and tau? get his bearings, he was incredibly grateful. In what Sarge thought was an incredibly annoying voice, he thanked us for the rescue, then asked what he could do to repay us Die! and return him to the Tau Empire. Everyone kept quiet on that last part, but Tink butted forward. He announced that for a start, the scientist could help him build a new drone. Spot had died for him after all. Then the techie started crying again, which set Fumbles off in turn. Nubby led the psyker away to look at pictures of happy puppies or something while everyone else went to find something less awkward to do, like talk to Jim and Hannah about their complex crisis of faith. Well, honestly, talking to Jim and Hannah about religion was- I don't like this series anymore. ...wasn't that awkward. They were a little confused about the stuff they'd seen on the Tauified Necron ship, and now thought senior tech priests were complete- assholes. Really? But that just put them on the same page as the rest of us. Mostly, we just sat there and nodded whenever they stopped talking. Then let them sit and think when they ran out of stuff to say. As for the rest of us, we were actually feeling pretty good. No. We'd completed our mission and no one, except Amy, had gotten shot. Sure, she looked rather odd and was completely up to her eyeballs on painkillers, mm -hmm. but the hospitalier probably knew how to regrow hair and would hopefully go to work on her before she came down. 
Also, as an added bonus, if we managed to keep the Tau scientist alive until we got back to Oak, he'd probably be so happy he'd forget about where that Necron ship had come from. He will not. Of course. There was still the whole thing about where the Necron and Heretech fleets might stop fighting and turn on us at any second, but there was nothing we could do about that, so we didn't bother worrying about it. Over the next few days, we got regular visits from Doc and the Hospitalier, mm -hmm. as well as the Adepts and the Captain. As a basic precaution, the Tau was crammed into one of Twitch's hidey holes during these visits. <laughs> he complained about the treatment until we explained what the Mechanicus did to mouthy Tau scientists. Yes. Anyway, everything was going fairly well, both in space and down on the planet. Okay. Battleaxe had successfully captured the hey, planetary Lord, governor and galvanized the PDF into a moderately competent defense against the Scarab Swarms. Okay. Several smaller cities and numerous towns had been de-peopled by the evil little bugs, Yay. leaving the silhouettes we'd seen on the dead world. God. But all the major population centers had been defended. After the Necrons had been engaged by the Heretics, the swarms had stopped porting in. So currently, she was just keeping everyone stable while the space battle worked itself out. Up in space, Sword Guy was mostly keeping everyone from doing anything stupid while the Xenos and Heretics mauled each other. Yeah, but I would have been utterly disappointed if they had attacked the, the combined fleets of the Xen, of the uh, Heretics and the Necrons. Never interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake. Astropathic communication was still down, but the reinforcements that were trickling in brought news of some other sort of major fleet force being gathered near the sector capital. If neither hostile fleet disengaged soon, it was looking like reinforcements would arrive in time. Good. Finally, the captain said the tech priests were still sitting tight and waiting for Juris, who was on the way but had no ETA. Okay. Since it seemed like he'd be deciding our fate, we asked Jim and Hannah exactly who Juris was. Unfortunately, they went full tech priest on us and only said that he was holy and not something we should ask questions about. Okay. We left it at that. Things were crowded enough in our quarters without starting any fights. On the third day of our little incarceration, news came that the Necron fleet had disengaged. They hadn't been defeated by any measure, they would just decided that the battle wasn't worth fighting or something. Makes they'd sense. pulled back to the edge of the system, then just vanished, leaving the badly mauled Heretech fleet standing there like idiots. The techs didn't immediately attack us though. Instead, they opted to spend a while licking their wounds and trying to find out where the Necrons had gone. At least, that's what it looked like. After a day of waiting, a substantial number of Heretech reinforcements came out of the warp, and the whole mess of them closed on the planet. For oh. Thank you, Slacker. Captain General Constantine Valdor versus Lorgar. Who would win? Typically, uh, Primarch versus Custodian. I'd always say the Primarchs wins, but I have no respect for Lorgar's martial ability. Um, Lorgar pre-heresy his martial ability... I have no respect for it whatsoever. Um, it's a toss-up at who would win that fight. It is a massive toss-up at who would win that fight. But at the same time, pre-heresy, I say Valdor would win. Post-heresy, it would be Lorgar because Lorgar unlocked his psychic potential. Which is bullshit. But at the same time, it it is what it is. I mean, they had to make Lorgar more complicated than a wet noodle and a taco fart, but it is what it is as far as Lorgar goes. Thank you, Slacker. Uh, Lord of the Undead says, here's some Blackstone. Love your content and keep up the good work. Who would win, Trazen or Old One-Eye? Trazen. Trazen always wins. Trazen always wins. And it, it, well, uh, no one, you're saying, okay, saying that Lorgar didn't die to Korax is like saying Mike Tyson couldn't beat you to death because a referee jumps in and stops Mike Tyson from beating people half to death 
Conrad Kurz saved Lorgar when Lorgar had Korax's claws through his chest and basically Lorgar was dead. Lorgar was dead to rights. Korax had him. But, um, yeah, like flat out, Korax, uh, Korax is one of the better fighters as far as the Primarchs go. But he was nothing compared to Lorgar, and he made sure Lorgar knew that during their during their fight. Um, thank you, Lord of the Undead. Thank you, Slacker. Tra uh, Bloody Magpie says, Trazen, the one being who can out backup plan Zinch. This is true. Uh, welcome, Christian Campbell. From what the captain told us later, the battle started about as expected. With the Heretics slowly pushing our makeshift fleet back with sheer weight of fire. Mm-hmm. After half a day of holding actions, our guys had taken a beating and morale nearly broke when a major incoming warp signature was detected, coming in behind the Heretech fleet. Nice. Thankfully though, instead of more tech reinforcements, it turned out to be a friendly fleet and not a little dinky one. Yay. It was an Honest to the Emperor, or Omnissiah, Explorator fleet. I shit you not, there was an Ark Mechanicus leading it. It wasn't even a slaughter. That implies there were pieces left over. <laughs> it was a complete bloody annihilation. If you do not know what an Ark Mechanicus is, it's a monster. It's an absolute damn monster. Or at least, that's what the captain had told us. We couldn't see it ourselves because some batshit cogboys wouldn't let us out of our quarters. So it wasn't hard to put two and two together and see that this holy Joris guy was probably the reason there was a Mechanicus fleet here now. Yeah. Sure enough, word came down that the system was now under his... jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Everyone was to sit tight while he investigated reports of tech heresy and took corrective measures. Oh, boy. This sounded ominous, but since the person who said it had a bloody arc at his command, we all sat tight. Yeah, if the guy that's supposed to be judging you... Okay, let, let's let's rack it up, okay? You have a Tau Earthcast member. You have several pieces of Tau machinery. You have several Tau weapons. And the guy that's going to be judging you just showed up in an art mechanicus. How fucked are you? Press X in the chat for completely fucked. F in the chat for Superman on acid fucked. After two more days of stewing, stuff started happening. Some fancy looking tech priests we didn't recognize came in and asked for Jim and Hannah. Tink and Twitch were in favor of shooting them, or at least telling them to bugger off. But the engine seers said it was okay. These guys were from the Ordos Juris. We were all sort of torn as Jim and Hannah were let off. They were our mates and we were worried for them. Mm. But on the other hand, the cheeky buggers had let us think that Juris was just some guy's name for something like two weeks. Anyway, our cog boy and cog girl were returned without any signs of damage and the tech heresy investigation continued without touching on us again. The priests never came down to ask us any questions, really? and they never searched our quarters for Tau scientists or disguised pulse weapons. It was rather worrying at first, since good luck like this tends to be followed by some even larger dose of bad. Yes. But Jim and Hannah said it made sense. They started to explain that it was some sort of treaty between the Ordos and the Inquisition. Okay. Then stopped when they realized no one but the Tau scientist and Fumbles was actually listening. Ha! <laughs> Speaking of the Tau scientist, we were beginning to regret rescuing him. Yeah, I did. Quite aside from the risk of being correctively measured by the Ordos Juris, mm -hmm. he was incredibly annoying. Really? Theo. Really? You rescued a Tau and he's incredibly annoying. What are the odds? What are the absolute odds? As everyone but Tink called them, was an infuriating combination of neurotic, naive, hyperactive, pedantic, 
and curious. The fact that no one had strangled him as a child was pretty much proof that Tau civilian worlds really are as non-violent as they claim. Mm -hmm. Back when we'd been encouraging him to talk, Theo spun us a rather odd tale of the whole mess from his perspective. He'd been a technician on a Tau border world, and specialized at integrating other races' tech. He'd mostly work in a government lab, but occasionally he'd go out to inspect some passing ship's systems. A rogue trader had come in, volunteered for inspection, and taken him to see a tech priest who had seemed a little strange. Okay. Shortly after he'd looked at the fascinating ship the priest had been working on, everything had gone dark. When Fio woke up, his fire warrior guards were gone and he'd been given a new job. Yay. Aside from the kidnapping, the slavery, and the fact that his boss was quite insane even before he'd had the Jokero augment his brain, the job was quite interesting. They'd stayed in their part of the vessel and done what research they- One second, I gotta deal with the dark mechanicum here. Yeah, just dealing with the art mechanic in one second. Yeah, I think I got it taken care of. There we go. Uh, it's been perched. They could while the traders searched for a new proper lab for- <laughs> Shall a snap, there is no love, only war. For them. Eventually, the trader had found this planet, brokered a favorable arrangement, then went on his way. After that, it had been much easier to get the parts and tools he needed, but the guards were much more unpleasant. Theo had been getting rather worried that he'd never be returned to the Tau Empire before we'd shown up and rescued him. We all just skirted around that subject. Anyway, the Tau scientist was brilliant and annoying, so it was no surprise that he got along well with Tink. What was surprising was that Jim and Hannah took to him as well. When they weren't all tinkering on Spot 2.0, the four of them would sit around watching Tau vids that Tink had gotten from somewhere. The rest of us avoided their area like the plague. Our sort of imprisonment finally ended just before any of us got frustrated enough to kill each other. Nice. Doc finally got out of the wheelchair, led the relief force with the captain, other interrogators, and adepts at his back, they informed us of our freedom and invited us up to the main conference room for a final debriefing. Okay. We were hesitant to leave at first, but Jim sent a skull and confirmed that the combat servitors that had been watching our doors for the last dozen days were actually gone. Yay! Uh, Hobbit says, don't forget to sp neuter spay your pets. Yes, do that to the towel, please. Please. <sighs> yeah, thank you, Hobbit. When we got to the briefing room, it was occupied by a single, ordinary-looking tech priest and some guy who looked like a diplomat. Okay. Jim and Hannah practically fell over themselves, bowing and scraping when they saw the priest, so we figured he was the head Majos Joris, or whatever you call it. The Majos responded by screeching something in binary, mm -hmm. prompting the two engine seers to look embarrassed, then sit down and shut up. That was the only thing the Majos ever said. Everything else came from his diplomat helper. Yay. To start with, there was a presentation of legal documents stating the entire system was more or less Mechanicus property until they were sure no Necron or Heretech fleets would be returning. Battleaxe and Sword Guy were invited to stay on as official inquisitorial observers to the transition of government. Okay. Neither interrogator acted surprised and both accepted so it was probably fixed beforehand. The Majos' assistant continued the matter of tech heresy. The system was littered with little fragments of Necron and Heretech ships, but there was no indication that any pieces of the modified ship had survived. It was the Ordos Juris' official standpoint that this was a good thing. Okay. From the few scraps of research they'd examined and Jim and Hannah's testimony, 
They were of the opinion that the hybrid of Xenotech on the Necron vessel was deeply heretical and destroying it was the correct response. Okay. Our squad was congratulated for its thoroughness as were Jim and Hannah for resisting the Xenotech's allure where so many others had failed. The two engine seers literally glowed at this. Okay. The rest of us tried to maintain our poker faces. Mm -hmm. Finally, the discussion came around to our ship's tech priesthood. In the Majos' opinion, their actions were not treasonous or heretical, but they had not been ideal. Since our ship's non-ordained engineering staff seemed unusually capable, the entire priesthood was being transferred off-ship for... re-education. Yay! Jim and Tana... In other words, they're about to get their hard drives reformatted. They're about to be refurbished! Yay! Uh, Slacker, thank you. The Lion versus Mortarian and Typhon. How badly would the two come out of that fight? Well, Mortarian and Typhon would not come out of that fight. They'd both be dead. More t like the lacking plot necessity. Mortarian is not one of the best fighters. He's one of the more capable of absorbing damage. But no, Typhon and Mortarian would both die to the lion. The lion's just too good as far as uh, being able to just simply whoop that ass. Um, thank you, Slacker. Hobbit says, keep the towel in case the ship's food runs out. You know what? We do have Taco Tuesday coming up. We do have Taco Tuesday. And Earthcast, maybe we can add some Taco Spice and be good with that. Thank you, Hobbit. Good suggestion. Uh, Aquila. Thank you, Aquila. Uh, Bloody Magfly says, Blue Burger. Aquila says, A reasonable tech priest with an art mechanicus. Be afraid. Be very, very afraid. Yes. Like, something about this is beginning to worry me, as a matter of fact. And, thank you, Aquila. And Dark Innovator says, Lion is anti-demon. He's literally been fighting things like Mortarian since he was old enough to walk. So, the, the, the ass whooping of that, the ass whooping would be intense. Because, that's the Lion's whole shtick. Refurbished tech priest. Yes, Kyfer. ...would remain as the ship's senior priests, and a tithe of fresh acolytes would be transferred in from other ships in the system to fill out the roster until we finished our return voyage. This time they didn't glow. Mm. Hannah froze, and Jim looked like he was about to faint. <coughs> Tink slapped Jim on the back and said he'd be happy to help out. Sarge told them to shut it. With that final little announcement, the Majos Joris left with the other interrogators in tow, and the captain went to see to his ship. This left just our team and the stunned engine seers with the translator guy. To our surprise, he came over and introduced himself as a Majos as well, okay. despite his apparent lack of metal bits. As he got closer, we all started getting uneasy. It got to the point where something sprang loose in Twitch's head, and Sarge had to grab his laser pistol before he shot the guy. Now that we saw him up close, he was definitely a tech priest. Okay. There's normal looking, then there's aggressively normal looking. The guy looked like someone had sculpted every inch of his body to exactly average human specifications. Huh. It was amazingly creepy. Anyway, the creepily diplomagos went to where Jim and Hannah were still silently freaking out and assured them they'd do fine. The Inquisition was the perfect place for them. Both of them should embrace it and take the chance to watch, learn, and grow. Yes. Because they'd need every scrap of experience. See, when their service to the Inquisition... Tyler says, my refurbished Gellerfield uh, generator started glowing green. Well, that just means you're closing in on an orc fleet in the warp. Enjoy. Inquisition ended, they weren't going to sit in some manufactorum for the rest of their days. Jim and Hannah had been marked for something greater. They'd be joining the Ordos Joris. Oh. 
This news did absolutely nothing to reduce the two engine seers' panic levels, <laughs> and the Diplomagos let out a very unsettling laugh oh, as yay. he turned to the rest of us. <laughs> he handed Sergeant Data Slate and informed us that their ship had more efficient methods of communication than astropaths. The Diplomagos had informed our Inquisitor of the situation and its findings. Oak had sent this in reply. Of course, the Ordos Joris would never read the Inquisition's private communications, uh -huh, of but he not. suspected our Inquisitor had an interesting little task for us to perform on our return trip. Sarge pocketed the slate without comment and tried to stare down someone who apparently never blinked. Good job. Try it. In an effort to save Sarge, Doc stepped in and asked the Majos if his Ordos would be taking over the pursuit of the rogue trader who'd sold the Necron ship. The tech priest switched his unsettling gaze to Doc for a while, then said that in this matter, the Ordos Joris only had interest in those who committed or ordered the commission of tech heresy. Oh. Everyone who'd worked on the heretical project was already dead, nice. primarily by our hands, okay. and the entirety of the planet's nobility was being examined for degree of guilt. Currently, Which means degree of how severely you're about to die. They were not concerned with rogue traders being rogue traders. Though whoever initially provided them with Necron Vessel would be of interest. Or would be if the Inquisition hadn't already claimed jurisdiction over the matter, that is. Doc decided that he did not want to talk to the scary Majos anymore. Everyone clammed up and avoided eye contact in hope that the Joris would get the hint and leave. It doesn't. Smiling that creepy smile, the Diplomagos told us unless we were incredibly unlucky, we'd never encounter him or the Ordos Joris again. Okay. But they'd be watching us with great interest. No. No. On that unsettling note, he wished us good luck and good hunting then left. Twitch muttered something about the Mechanicus being full of weirdos. Ugh. The rest of us, including Jim and Hannah, agreed. Ugh, tech priests are weird. Hobbit says, suggestion, a day for live SCP streams. Um, Hobbit, I've actually been giving a lot of thought to something for SCP because it seems to be very, very popular and I'm enjoying learning about it. We'll talk about that after the stream. Thank you, sir. Nubby suggested that this was probably a good time to go get a drink. Mm -hmm. Possibly in the mess hall where the betting pool was scheduled to finally be concluded in about 20 minutes. Okay. No one questioned how he managed to know this despite being locked in the same quarters as the rest of us. Don't ask. You don't want to know. The mess was, of course, packed. Nearly everyone had been in on the pool, and even if they hadn't won, they wanted to see who did, or if their stake would be refunded. Uh -huh. Fumbles, the adepts, and the tech priests took one look at the press of bodies and decided it wasn't worth it. But us- Alright. Second, second, second. What's going on? I'm dropping frames. One second. All right, so I do not know if, yeah, just a brief burst. I'm just going to wait for it to clear up. Sometimes it happens like this. I'm just going to wait for it to clear up. I'm still transmitting at a high volume, but I'm just going to wait for it to stop doing this. Yes, steak. Yeah, steak sounds good, actually. All right, looks like it's clearing up. All right, I'm going to go ahead and hit play again. Dotty guardsmen couldn't be deterred so easily, and made heavy use of our feet and elbows to carve a path. Mm -hmm. Nubby and, surprisingly, Amy were the most vicious about it, <laughs> and managed to get all the way to the table the quartermaster was standing on. Surprisingly, he was backed up by the captain and some heavily armed armsmen. Upon seeing us, the quartermaster visibly flinched and hefted his lockbox and ledger like some sort of shield. The captain prodded him, then bellowed for silence. 
It took the quartermaster a few tries to get started, but eventually he listed off the agreed upon rules of the pool. Yes. He then began going down the number and size of the bets on each category, until he finally reached the winning one. In a quavering voice, he announced that most of the people who had bet on the Xenos species known as Necrons had been allowed to withdraw their bets due to extenuating circumstance. Okay. Nubby grinned hugely, then registered the word, most. Most. It turned out that the only remaining bet in the category was a wager of 20 thrones, by Amelia Deloresista Amanita Trigestrata Zeldana Malifi von Humpeding. The Navigator. What the hell? Fighting. Okay, thank you, Hobbit. Appreciate that. Amy screamed in triumph. No, it was Amy. Nubby frothed in rage and had to be restrained by Twitch and Sarge. <laughs> the rest of the room either exploded into laughter or started muttering about things being rigged. Mm. Then the captain bellowed for silence again, and the quartermaster resumed speaking. Unfortunately, he said, since the winning bet was placed by a latecomer and w therefore was made with an unfair amount of knowledge... The ship's senior officers had decreed that the payout would be limited to a factor of 100 to 1. The remainder would be forfeited into a special budget to be distributed for the good of the vessel, as decided by its most honorable and wise captain. Oh, that's bullshit! While Amy cursed a blue streak and Nubby took a turn raucously laughing, <laughs> the rest of the room dissolved into even more angry muttering. Finally, the captain stepped into center stage and announced that for the good of this vessel, the first use of the budget would be to supply this mess with unlimited rations of Sakura for the remaining of the evening. This was met with much more enthusiasm. There we go. As the party erupted around us and Amy and Nubby screamed at each other and the poor quartermaster, Sarge finally got around to reading Oak's message. Okay. Unsurprisingly, it was a new assignment to be performed before returning. He read the orders, swore, then flagged down the captain, who swore even harder. <laughs> Both men decided they needed somewhere more quiet to think things over and, swear and headed up to the bridge. As they left, Doc flagged them down and asked what was going on. He was shown the first line of Oak's orders, which read, the Emperor's Scythe Space Marine chapter has agreed to undertake the capture of a living Tyranid Zoanthrope for study. No! You are to assist them in this mission in any way possible and handle the transportation of the creature to my laboratories. Oh no! Interrogator Greg's. Oh no! Oh damn it! Yeah, get drunk. Everybody get drunk about this one. This is how Oak lets you know he is very pissed at you. This is how he lets you know he's pissed at you. Oh my god. No. That's horrible. Oh, man. Well, how do you know if Professor Oak is pissed at you? He sends you after the Pokemon that bites back. Uh, press X in the chat for what the fuck, because that is horrifying. Um, yes. The nids are coming. Huzzah! Anyhow, one second. Let me take a look at tomorrow so I can determine what's going to happen. Aquila says, Gent gentlemen, it is time to bend over and kiss your butt goodbye. Thank you, Aquila. Yeah, indeed it is. I'm going to check out the length of the episodes for the next couple, because I saw they were kind of a little bit shorter. Let's see. Oh, wow, there's a lot of episodes for this one. You know what? Let's see. Let's see. Uh, two hour. Eh. Yeah, this is the beginning of a messed up mission. I could see that. It's like nine episodes. Okay. It gets worse. It can always get worse, Christian. That's the number one thing about 40K that I love the best. It can always get worse. 
Okay, so tomorrow we're going to watch... Let's see. Considering they're mostly about 20 minutes, we'll watch the first four to five episodes of uh, the Tyranid episodes. It always can get worse. It's just it's just a thing. Tyler Holt says, Hey, Commissar, I got a refurbished stations field generator. You want it for this one? Nope. I don't want to be around the Tyranids. Uh, first live stream back was a blast. Good work, Commissar. Bloody, you have a wonderful day. And, guys, I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. I really do appreciate you guys coming by to spend some time with the old man. It just is what it is. This scares me, Marines. Nits. Oh, boy. I fear a cutter 2.0 on the rise. Oh, yes. Slacker, thanks. Uh, many guardsmen kill themselves facing Nits. Yes, they do. In fact, this... <coughs> if you remember, this guardsman party was assembled by the remains of several regiments facing off against Nids and Orcs. So, yeah, this is about to get rather fun. Um, thank you, Slacker. I should be happy with the towel crapping his pants while being being tyrannid bait. I'm always happy for towel crapping the pants while being tyrannid bait. I don't know. I don't really... I don't really feel pity, but Jesus Christ, they're going after... They're going after a... Tyranid Psyker. <coughs> ah. Catch you later, Guardsman Enjoyer. You have a nice day. Now, I said I wanted to talk about... Um, all right, Aquila. I said I wanted to talk about possible game streams. Um, I'm actually going to be jumping in open comms and talking through the options that I have. And we'll see which one uh, people like the best. If you aren't in Discord, take a look down in the description down below. There's a link to that. Also, one one once again because there's a whole blah, 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 there's a whole bunch of people in here. Ronnie is uh, rolling out his map for 40k, and I got guys. It's awesome, and you've got to take a look at it. It is frankly awesome. Um, but I will be in open comms in about five minutes, and I hope to talk to a whole bunch of you guys. Until then, um, yeah, this was the Garzen party, and oh my god, uh, Hobbit says he just put two perk points into strength for his chain sword wielding Astartes and a point into Party Boy, which doubles the effect of alcohol. Nine Mile Marine will drink ammo second, get plus four to kill bugs. Yes. <laughs> All right, guys. I'll catch you guys to wait. Is today Saturday? Which means we're watching the first part of the Xena, first part of um, Tyranny Acquisition Experts tomorrow. Yes, yes. See you guys tomorrow. It's about the same bat time, about the same bat channel. And now I'm gonna click some buttons. <laughs>